Good morning, everyone. If uh, you can take your seats, we could get started. Good morning. My name is Rory Lantzman, and I am chair of the Committee on the Justice System. Welcome all of you to this hearing on issues of criminal discovery practices in New York City. We are joined by Council Member Alan Maisel, who is a member of the committee. In 2015, a New York State Bar Association task force on criminal discovery declared that, quote, overhauling criminal discovery in New York is urgently needed and long overdue. Finding that current law and practice deprived criminal defendants of, quote, critical materials that are necessary for them to make informed decisions about their cases, to undertake proper investigations, to intelligently assess plea offers, offers to secure and use exculpatory evidence, and to adequately prepare for trial before the last minute. A task force convened by the Chief Judge of the State of New York was hardly sparing in its own critique of the current system of disclosure. Though the minimum standards for criminal discovery are governed by state law and are the topic of much discussion in Albany at present, our city's five district attorneys have developed their own policies and procedures to complement or supplement state law requirements. <clears throat> These policies have a direct impact on the operations of their offices and on those of the public defenders, the courts, and arguably the Department of Corrections. They also affect the operations of an overall administration of justice in our city. What, what, what role, if any, does the state's discovery statute and each district attorney's office's own rules and practices play in the fair and efficient administration of justice, particularly as it relates to promoting speedy trials, facilitating appropriate plea negotiations, preventing wrongful convictions, and ensuring that victims and witnesses come forth and testify at trial. These are some of the questions we hope to find answers to today and potentially guide the council as it considers what steps it can take to promote a criminal discovery process in the five boroughs that addresses a system that nearly everyone agrees needs significant improvement. With that, um, I uh, call our first panel of witnesses to testify. Let me also mention that we are joined by Council Member Debbie Rose of Staten Island, who is a member of the committee. And if you all would raise your right hand and be sworn in, we can get started. Do you, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Is there any particular order that you've sorted out? I've been voted, I've been voted to go first. Good. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Council Member, for uh, conducting this hearing. My name is Lisa Schreibersdorf, and I'm the Executive Director of Brooklyn Defender Services. I have been a defense attorney in Brooklyn for over 30 years, and I've worked under th four different uh, DAs. Um, uh, I think the reason that I'm chosen to go first is to talk about the practices in Brooklyn regarding discovery. Um, when I'm done talking about Brooklyn, the stories you're going to hear from the other boroughs are going to be very different, um, of course. Brooklyn, I think, is the model of what could be done or the best that can be done under our very um, inadequate discovery statute. In other words, our DA has made a decision, um, and this goes back to uh, Charles Hines in the, I would say, in the early 90s, made a decision that um, police reports and other information about the case should be turned over to the defense. Um, and he started doing that on a trial basis with one, you know, one court part, and it was only a couple of months before they realized that when they had turned over the information early in the case, the case is resolved much more quickly. So that was that pilot project, which went on, was supposed to go for a year, ended up going for about two months and was expanded throughout the whole county. Um, that was continued, that policy was continued after that with Ken Thompson and now with Eric Gonzalez as acting DA and now he's an elected DA in our borough. Um, so what that means is that, generally speaking, 
after the Supreme Court arraignment, which is already about a month into the case, but at the Supreme Court arraignment, you are, or soon thereafter, you are handed a packet of information about the case. That will include the grand jury minutes, it will include the police reports, it will include any other evidence that the DA has in their file, um, and you know, and, and for the most part, they are compliant with that, and for the most part, we don't have a lot of problems with that. Um, unlike many assertions that you've heard from other uh, district attorneys around the state and, in, and the city, um, there, we do not have a problem with witness safety, we do not have a problem with you know, many of the concerns that, um, that you hear. When there is any issue, let's say it's a case with a gang and it's a known gang and the district attorney in that case feels that it's not a good idea to turn over the materials, they actually ask the court for what they call a protective order even though under our law they're not required to turn it over. So they are extremely respectful to the process that they have envisioned and they follow through with it as if it was required. Um, it is done through what is called a stipulation, which was signed, I'm going to say, in 1990, where they've agreed to turn over all the information. Um, there are certain circumstances where they believe it is not a good idea to turn over information, and in that case, they, they do not do so. Um, I just want to say that, you know, for the most part, I want to really reinforce that it is a positive experience, and I feel we're very fortunate. Our clients are extremely fortunate because they have the information, for the most part, in our cases. However, I, it is not a perfect system, you know, and I just need to say that most people plead guilty, and oftentimes these pleas take place early in a case before the time even comes for discovery. Case, cases are offered, you know, clients are offered plea bargains, let's say, pre-indictment, which is something our chief judge is pushing right now as a, as a met, you know, method of, you know, increasing the efficiency in the court system. It is you know, we don't have police reports and other information prior to indictment in order to properly advise our clients about a plea or, just, or investigate the case or look into the matters in time to really t advise somebody properly whether they should take, I don't know, it could be years in jail. Um, I mean, I think there are issues with having plea bargaining so early as well, but I mean, that's another point. Um, it is unlikely that we would ever get to see, let's say, a video statement so we would actually know what our clients said to the police you know, when they made the statement. It is unlikely that we would have a chance to view the police reports. It is very possible that we would know what the DA is saying they have because they would normally tell us at arraignment or on the phone, and I'm not saying that they wouldn't cooperate, but we don't have anything to look at. Um, another concern is that, you know, the DAs don't always have everything. So they may not be out there pushing to get materials that they should have because you know the system as it's working for them is it, in many ways the burden is sort of on the defense. You know they turn over what they have, and you know it may be their write-up, it may be the grand jury minutes, and it may be the basic police reports. But we may think, oh, you know what? There's probably some you know DD fives, which are detective reports. There's probably some other things. The burden really is on us to say, you know, I think these things probably exist. Can you try to get them? And then you know they do try, but it could take a long time, and. You know, obviously a system where the, they are under the obligation, that is a better system, obviously. And I know we're not here to talk about that. But I think just to understand that open file discovery is not a panacea for the problems that we have. Um, a couple of other issues that come up is that the Brooklyn DA's office does have a policy of not turning discovery over in certain kinds of cases. For example, their homicide unit um, is an exception. They don't turn, we, and my office doesn't do homicides as a rule, but there are certain units within the office that do not believe in, you know, open files. They're accepted from the rule, the general rule. Um, so those cases go the traditional route where we have to file motions and then we often get the materials at the last minute in those types of cases or never at all because most people take a plea and you may never get the material. Um, we do have, you know, delays in turning things over. We have things turned over in a piecemeal manner. It is very easy for something to get lost in the crowd because it's not an organized, you know, clear process that has timelines and any penalty for failure to comply with it because they're obviously not. Um, the other thing is, and I, I, th I think this is about discovery, it may be a little bit off, but you know, one of the issues with the evidence in the case, some of it is physical evidence, 
and we would normally want to examine the evidence, we would want to test it sometimes, and it is very difficult to get access to that type of evidence. It is extremely difficult. So although the policy is very good regarding you know, documents, which is mostly what it is, it is not as effective when it comes to other types of discovery that we think we should uh, be able to get to. Um, I wanted to talk about one other thing, and then, of course, I'll answer any questions if you have. Um, all right, I'm aging myself, but back in the 80s, we used to, um, we used to use our, defense attorneys have subpoena power, and we used to use our subpoena power to get police reports. And I'm just thinking there aren't too many people around that still remember that, but it was routine. We would get a case, the first thing we would do is write up a set of subpoenas for the police reports, and we would go to the judge, and the judge would sign them. And then we would file them, and we would get the police reports, and we'd go to one police plaza. Um, at some, and at some point, they started redacting witness um, addresses and phone numbers, and of course, that makes sense, because the police at that point don't really know what's happened since then. And then at some point, the police department started moving to quash these subpoenas, and they were successful in getting appellate division case law that indicated that if something is discoverable, I think that's the basis of the cases, um, if it's discoverable, it's not subject to subpoena. Of course, these things aren't really discoverable, but you know, that's, let's just leave that to the courts. Um, the reason I'm bringing it up is because I actually think that's a space that the city council could consider looking at a little more carefully. Like, why did the police, you know, decide to move to quash these subpoenas? What was the policy that went into that? Is that something that, that could be changed? You know, are they still committed to that policy? You know, sometimes something happens and you stick with it for 20 years and you forget that it was ever different. So I just wanted to bring that up and, um, and, and you know, pass it to my colleague. Unless you have any questions. Good. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Um, thank you very much uh, to the committee and to the chair for recognizing that despite this being a state law issue, that there are actually things that have been done good in New York City under the existing law, and that New York City actually and its DAs could act right now to provide justice and efficiency, and four out of the five simply elect not to do it. I'm Tina Longo. I'm the attorney in charge of the criminal defense practice at Legal Aid, and in that role, I'm the chief defender of our citywide trial offices that represent um, over 150,000 New Yorkers that find themselves at the, uh, in the courts uh, accused of crimes who desperately seek the system to provide due process. So let me paint a picture of the difference between what Lisa was talking about in Brooklyn and what uh, our clients in the four other boroughs and our attorneys experience by painting a picture, a true picture. You are at Rikers Island and you are under bail, in bail, on bail, and you are desperately trying to figure out what to do. Do I take a plea? Do I go to trial? What's the evidence against me? And you're, you want desperately, as you should be able to do, engage in your own defense, partnering with your defense attorney, your public defender. And when you reach out to your public defender and you, are, and you ask for a copy of what the government has against you, in Manhattan, in Queens, in Staten Island, and in the Bronx, every single day our public defenders have to say, we don't have it yet. But they've offered you a deal. And suppose your, cell, your, your uh, cellmate is actually being prosecuted and represented in Brooklyn by either BDS or legal aid, and you watch them going over their evidence, talking about how they've spoken to, with their public defender or their attorney as to what they're going to do next, and they're engaged actively in their own due process. Imagine now the feeling you have as being the person who actually doesn't have the benefit of that. 
Okay, that's not imaginary. That happens every single day. And it's because four out of the five district attorneys choose not to voluntarily do what Brooklyn has done for decades. I sort of want to paint that. I paint that as a, a sort of picture, and then I'll get into some, some details. But my colleagues uh, from the other defenders, I'm sure, will fill in the gaps. So every single day, I feel like I either look on Twitter um, or in the news, and I see district attorneys jumping over themselves to talk about reform, how they're not prosecuting any longer turnstile jumps, and they're not asking for bail on misdemeanors. And it feels like uh, it just is sort of every day that they are at the table, first and foremost, announcing it to the press. I want to pause a moment to say that I've done a fair amount of hearings in front of this body and others where government goes first, except I'm told this morning that they have decided today not to be in the front of this issue, but to be in the back of the issue by testifying last, which means they want to anticipate their answers. So I'm going to sort of phrase for you some of the things you should ask them that I'm anticipating they're going to say. And then I want to talk about two specific examples of, uh, in, in Manhattan and Queens that I think you should be wary of. The first thing is you should really ask them, why actually the four of them out of it not following Brooklyn? Right? That's the first question. The second question perhaps you should anticipate is, I think they're going to anticipate they're making efforts, that some of them are talking to our offices and others about putting in plans. I want you to really test the validity of that and say to you as the public defender who is in court every single day asking for evidence, those small steps that they're doing is nowhere close to Brooklyn and nowhere at all uh, producing real justice. I want to, uh, I hope you ask them why they are engaged actively in a lobby uh, with the District uh, Attorney Association of the State of New York and have been for decades to actually push back on discovery form. And the issue that they are using as their key throughout the state, but they are members, is witness tampering and protection. And I think it is really important to ask them whether or not they actually don't believe uh, either Charlie Hines or Ken Thompson or Eric Gonzalez in that if there were witness tampering happening in Brooklyn at the extent this state se se DA seemed to think, Brooklyn would have voluntarily changed back. So I ask you to think about that. I want to do two quick uh, examples of terrible policies that could be changed right now. One, in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, where I actually started my career as a public defender in 2002, routinely on felony cases, they redact the name of the person who is accusing your client of a crime on the felony complaint. It just says, a person known to the district attorney. I want to pause a moment and say, how is it that a public defender is supposed to investigate? How am I supposed to check for conflicts of interest? And I will tell you that there have been a fair number of those where I have <coughs> represented my client all the way and through up to hearings and then had to get relieved because then I learned the name and I do a conflicts check since we are the citywide provider and I've had to come off of cases and 18B has had to get assigned and any 18B attorney that takes over a case, if doing best practice, has to start from the scratch. These are people who are incarcerated so it's a justice issue, it's an efficiency issue. I've asked that it be changed. It could be changed because the other DAs don't do that and it's not been changed. Second thing, Queens. In Queens, there is a practice for felony cases that uh, you will be offered a deal if you waive your right to speedy trial and 18080, which is the presentment of grand jury, to get a deal except we don't get discovery. And if you don't t waive, they will put the case in the grand jury and indict your client and never make an offer. That is a terrible practice. I am concerned that the OCA is planning to actually now expand that to the Bronx, and it has uh, started, and uh, talks in Manhattan and Brooklyn as well and the Bronx, I mean, so all boroughs. I want you to figure that that could change. The Queens District Attorney could either remove that 
forceful coercion or provide discovery before someone is asked to take a plea when we are asked to waive a person's right to liberty and a person's right to go into the grand jury. So on that, I set the table for my colleagues. There are pages upon pages of examples in the testimony I've provided about real life situations of injustice and inefficiency. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, my name is Scott Levy. Uh, I am special counsel to the criminal defense practice at the Bronx Defenders, and uh, I thank you for this opportunity to testify today. Um, in 2013, Stephen Odias was convicted of a 2009 Bronx murder based on the testimony of a single eyewitness. The jury convicted Mr. Odias despite a lack of physical evidence linking him to the shooting and the fact that the sole eyewitness admitted that he was buzzed from smoking a marijuana cigarette at the time of the incident. Last April, after serving almost six years of his, 20, of his sentence of 25 to life, Mr. Odias was released from prison when it was discovered that the original prosecutor in his case had purposely with, withheld critical information from him and from the jury. Specifically, an investigation by Mr. Odias' post-conviction counsel revealed that the Bronx, district, uh, Bronx assistant district attorney uh, in the case under the former district attorney in the Bronx had intentionally redacted information from a police report that supported Mr. Odias' innocence. During a canvas of the building where the shooting occurred, detectives had interviewed a woman who described the shooter as tall, dark-skinned male with a heavy beard. Mr. Odias was short, light-skinned, and beardless. The eyewitness also claimed to have gone to high school with the shooter and even gave the detectives a copy of a yearbook photo of the man who she said did it. None of this information was turned over to counsel at trial, uh, and the assistant district attorney later told the New York Times that the redaction in the police report was actually intentional. A functioning system of discovery in the Bronx and a culture of transparency would likely have prevented this devastating miscarriage of justice. And sadly, without significant reform our discovery of our discovery practices, we can expect to see more stories like this in the future. New, York New York's discovery law, criminal procedure law article 240 is among the most restrictive and aggressive in the country. It requires only a minimal disclosure of information and virtually no mechanisms to ensure that, in that information is turned over in a timely manner, if at all. Years of practicing under the blindfold law have created a culture defined by a lack of transparency among prosecutors and courts in which critical evidence is regularly withheld and basic principles of due process and fairness are rarely enforced. In the Bronx, despite calls from the district attorney for more discovery to be turned over earlier, discovery remains a rather haphazard affair. Cases are adjourned unnecessarily for months on end, while discovery issues are litigated and resolved, adding to the already extreme delays in the Bronx court system. In our written testimony, we've outlined principles for meaningful discovery reform, namely that it be fair, early, and automatic, and that it incorporate common sense protections for witnesses. However, I wish to highlight one aspect uh, that my colleague from Legal Aid has already brought, uh, brought up, which is the need for discovery before guilty pleas. Only a tiny fraction of cases in our system ever go to trial. The vast majority of cases are resolved through a plea bargain. Because New York's discovery rules do nothing to guarantee transparency, thousands of New Yorkers serve jail and prison sentences and are subjected to the collateral consequences such as deportation, loss of employment, ineligibility for student loans, and eviction without ever having seen the evidence in their cases. Meaningful discovery reform must require prosecutors to turn over information before any guilty plea so that the accused can make an informed decision about whether to plead guilty or to go to trial. A discovery system that follows these principles will not only increase fairness, transparency, and equality, but will promote early and efficient resolution in cases by eliminating uncertainty and allowing plea negotiations in appropriate cases based on shared facts. These early resolutions will in turn contribute substantially to the city's goal of reducing the jail population and closing Rikers Island as quickly as possible. Um, and we hope that the city council can take a leading role in pushing the city's district attorneys uh, to adopt discovery reform policies and practices. Um, but I do want to just note what is going on in Albany. There are currently two bills pending uh, in Albany, one uh, in the State Senate, which is Senate Bill 7720, uh, 7722, and Assembly Bill 
4360A that would make New York a leader in discovery. Both bills would broaden access to discovery for the defense and the prosecution, require automatic discovery to take place early in the criminal process, and critically, mandate the discovery be turned over before the accused accepts a guilty plea. Both bills also include common sense mechanisms to protect witnesses whose safety might be jeopardized, include protective orders, which upon a showing of necessity prohibit defense attorneys from sharing sensitive information to their clients. These are common sense protections that can be easily adopted. The council should do what it can to support these bills in Albany. But more importantly, the council should encourage the city's district attorneys to adopt open file discovery practices and to turn over discovery before any guilty plea. As we've already heard, the, Bro the Brooklyn District Attorney's <coughs> Office has been doing this for years, showing that it can be done efficiently and safely, uh, and we'd ask that the council push the rest of the district attorneys to adopt similar policies uh, to make things, and to, to uh, have written standardized policies so that we can all be working uh, from the same set of rules and uh, encourage a culture of transparency and predictability. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Sergio Dallapava, the Director of Special Litigation for New York County Defender Services. Now, uh, we, we've been working on these issues, those of us advocating discovery reform for many years, and we hear um, a lot of the same talking points talking about efficiency in the system or how it might actually save money to have early and open discovery. But I, uh, what I think goes underappreciated is how much this issue is at its baseline a constitutional issue. It's my belief, and I've been practicing in Manhattan for over 20 years, that Manhattan DA's office um, practice in the area of criminal discovery is essentially a widespread and programmatic denial and deprivation of the constitutional rights of mostly indigent people of color. And while my colleagues um, have pointed out, you know, in the context of plea bargaining and bail, the, the importance of discovery. I want to focus a little bit on trials. I've conducted a great many trials in Manhattan. Trials are viewed as maybe the criminal justice system putting its best foot forward. Well, let me tell you what, in my experience, a trial in Manhattan looks like. A case has been pending at least six months. It's un very uncommon for a felony to go to trial in less than six months, more likely about a calendar year. You get sent to a judge. When I say you, I mean the defense attorney and the client. Get sent to a judge who knows nothing about the case. This judge is there to try the case. You get sent to this judge after about a calendar year. You arrive at the part. The DA comes in with a cart, opens it up, and drops on your desk about six inches of material. This is Rosario material. And if you object, which for many years we did, and said to, turned to the judge and said, I need an adjournment. Look what I've just been given. The judge will say to you the truth, which is they're complying with the statute, right? But as my colleague from Legal Aid has pointed out, the statute only sets a baseline. As we've seen in Brooklyn, as we see, DAs can do far more. It's within their discretion the way they handle discovery. The statute merely sets the baseline, and in my opinion, sets an unconstitutional baseline. Because regardless of what happens, it's my belief, that one, if the trial goes forward at that point, regardless of how that trial is conducted, that individual, that person, has been deprived of their Sixth Amendment right to the effective assistance of counsel, right? So our Constitution doesn't say you're guaranteed just an attorney. It says you're guaranteed an attorney who can provide you effective assistance. But how effective is your attorney when they are handed discovery material the day they start picking a jury? One of the central obligations of any defense attorney is to investigate the claims against your client. How effective an investigator are you when you discover the name of the individual who's accusing your client at the day you're picking a jury? How effective are you when the first time you see a police report is the day you're picking a jury? The first time you get grand jury minutes, right? Sworn testimony under oath by the people accusing your client and the first time you get it is the day you're picking a jury. This is not only a deprivation of your client's right to effective assistance of counsel, their right to confront the witnesses against them, their right to due process, their right to a fair trial. These central tenets of our criminal justice system are being routinely 
routinely violated by the district attorney's office without any cause. Because anybody who is against meaningful reform in New York has to explain what is so unique about Manhattan that 46 other states can have a more open and, and more dignified discovery procedure, and yet none of these ills befall them. Because you'll hear from the district attorney's office, well, it's about witness safety. We can't tell you who the, the witnesses are. We can't give you police reports. Don't buy that when you hear it. The va a, a majority of felony trials, and certainly at one point, the vast majority of felony trials dealt with drug cases, buy and bust operations, where there were no civilian witnesses, where the officers, the police officers were the only witnesses. Did the district attorneys routinely hand over discovery material in those cases, since there was no concerns about witness safety? Absolutely not. This is a strategic decision by them to press an advantage that was given to them by statute, given to them without concern for the individual rights of indigent people of color, and which they are now pressing to their strategic advantage. And they'll admit it. I'm not imputing some kind of bad faith to them. They'll admit it to me. They'll say, you'll get the discovery material when we get sent to the part, and I see that the case is really going forward. What does that mean? What do they fear? They fear you'll go to a part, somehow the case will get adjourned, and you'll have the discovery material for the two weeks that the case gets adjourned to. I've had, everybody in my office has had countless DAs tell them precisely that. Once I know the case is really going forward, that's just code for once I know you can't fully investigate what I'm about to tell you, then I will hand you the discovery material and comply with the statute. Any claim from them that they, that they are just practicing in accordance with some kind of statutory framework and that it's not the pressing of an absolutely illegitimate advantage is baseless and should be challenged by this committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me mention that we've been joined by council members. Uh, I don't remember if I recognize council member Rose, but if I did, she gets a second shout out. Member of the committee from Staten Island, council member Cohen from the Bronx is a member of the committee and council member King um, from the Bronx uh, as well. Uh, so uh, I'm just a simple country lawyer and not everyone in the council uh, is lawyer at all. So before we get into the, the, de the, 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 the details, um, which I very much want to get into, can one of you just explain for us uh, the distinction between uh, Brady material, Rosario material, and the discovery rules? There is a perception that I have encountered in discussing this issue with my colleagues. Well, doesn't the Constitution require that um, uh, the district attorneys turn over certain information, and what does the discovery laws have to do with that? The short version, though. I'll do my best. Um, we'll start with Brady, right? Brady is information that tends to show uh, that a person is innocent or that a or guilty of a lesser crime or that a um, a witness has uh, problems with credibility so it, it, information that undercuts the principal case of of the prosecution so Brady material is uh, DAs must turn that over uh, they must turn it over at a time and what the law essentially says is at a time that it can be useful so, there so are by, no by definition the information that the district attorneys have that um, inculpates your client that 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 actually supports their case against the defendant they under Brady Brady has nothing to do with that right that's right so okay. but in, in in the case that I spoke about in my testimony that was very clearly Brady information an eyewitness identified someone who looked nothing like the person that they had arrested that would be sort of quintessential Brady material uh, Rosario is a, is sort of a broader category Rosario refers to statements of witnesses who are going to be called at trial right so prior statements of people who are going to actually be testifying at, at, at a trial or at a hearing. Um, and, and that, too, must be turned over, but it, uh, again, there are no time frames for that. So that is the information that my colleague from New York County was talking about that gets sort of plopped down on the desk uh, as the jury pool files into the courtroom. A discovery is, in theory, could encompass everything else, right? That information that you're talking about that, in, that may inculpate uh, somebody, that is, police paperwork generated by an officer who will not be testifying, right? A number of officers or detectives or law enforcement personnel or just, you know, anybody 
touch a case and create paperwork, create statements, generate evidence and material, right? That is not necessarily tied to a person who will be testifying at trial. All of that is potentially discoverable. However, under New York's law, a lot of that is not discoverable. There is a, a huge sort of universe of material that is associated with a case that in other states is absolutely discoverable, but in New York is not discoverable. Uh, but uh, under an open uh, system, could open you rattle off those examples? What what is discoverable in other, uh, wh wh whichever one of you, and then I want to get into Brooklyn. What is discoverable in other states that is not discoverable here, as, as you're describing? Well, so in North Carolina, for example, they are they that, have that that liberal bastion. Yes, they have open file discovery, yeah. which means anything in the file gets turned over, right? And that happens fairly early in the case. It is sort of radical transparency, which is sort of as it should be. Um, so there are no limitations to what is discoverable. It is whatever is in the prosecution's file. Um, and, and that allows everyone to know what all of the evidence is. It doesn't allow district attorneys to pick and choose what they believe to be relevant or not relevant or what they believe to ex be exculpatory or not exculpatory. It basically says, here's what we've got. There are common sense protections if, if there's real reasons not to turn something over. But the, the default is to turn over everything. Um, other states sort of have a laundry list of things. They say you must turn over A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and those are generally relatively comprehensive lists. So there are sort of two models. There's one that says turn over everything, and then there are other models that sort of create a, a list uh, that must be turned over. But generally, New York is among the four worst states in terms of what must be turned over. 46 states require more to be turned over. Sorry, maybe I missed it. Could you give us some examples of the kinds of things that in New York are not required to be turned over? Sure. Police reports written by officers who will not be testifying. Um, not, not, uh, even, not even like the day of the trial, here's your six inches. Right. So, uh, not uh, at all. Rosario, you'll often see, for example, the Manhattan DA's office bifurcate their Rosario material. You'll, you'll, you'll do a pretrial hearing before the trial. They say, here's the Rosario. You say, oh, this is the Rosario. No, that's the Rosario for the hearing. In other words, I'm only calling these two officers at the hearing, so here's the Rosario that I have to give you as a matter of law. I still have this other section of Rosario that is applicable to the trial. And then, as Mr. Uh, uh, Scott is pointing out, there's this whole other material that I'm not even calling them as witnesses on the trial. So you'll just never even be aware of its existence. I may have interviewed a witness, but if they're not being called as a witness at the trial, it's not technically Rosario, because Rosario is prior statements by witnesses at the trial in the control of the people. I mean, it really just gets that. Yeah. Any ludicrous. other examples? Thank you. Yeah. I, again, I, it, it is so very broad. But let's say, for example, uh, a person is arrested for you know, an alleged crime. The officer who makes the arrest fills out the arresting officer paper, paperwork. So that is what the person looked like when they were arrested, where and when they were arrested. But let's say three days later, other detectives go out and canvass the building. They ring on door, they knock on doors, talk to potential witnesses, and they discover that somebody heard a noise or saw something or you know, has some sort of piece of information. Those detectives may write up a separate report. The district attorney may d determine that that canvas material isn't relevant to their case. They're not going to call the detectives who did the canvas. And so the paperwork that was generated through that canvas would not have to be turned over because it's not related to a person who would be called at the at the. But the I, trial. I should point out that from the, I don't know if, if everybody will agree with me, but from the defense perspective, our largest issue is not that we don't get something ultimately. It's that when, it's the timing, right? Or, or for example, certainly in a case where um, a, cl a defendant takes a plea, right, and the case never gets to trial or never gets to hearing, you literally will never see a police report in that case. There, that is the vast majority of ways criminal cases end in this city, is a, a client taking a plea and, and serving a sentence without ever having seen a police report or anything really tangible beyond a criminal court complaint. Right. So I want to get into to, to Brooklyn. Um, just tell us, because you described Brooklyn, I don't, not so, these are not your words, but sort of like the gold standard for what, well, let, let the record reflect that the witness rolled her eyes. <laughs> well, I think it's uh, the gold standard <laughs> under our current system. Okay, let me just say that. Yes, I would agree okay. with that. And under this system, which so, is no, nowhere near a gold, you're qualified for a gold. Right, yes. It's not even eligible for the Olympics. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so when does the Brooklyn DA turn over this material? And, and does the Brooklyn DA also turn over this other material that 
they're not otherwise required to produce, or, or does their, what, what distinguishes them is, their, is merely the timing of them turning over the material that, that ultimately, if it went to trial, they would have to produce, but they're giving it to you up front. No, their philosophy is more like the open file philosophy that you heard about in North Carolina. They turn over whatever they have. Okay, with, you know, just remembering that if they think there's a problem with any particular item, they will approach the judge and ask for a protective order and say, we don't want to turn it over because we have a fear of any kind of witness safety or intimidation. And obviously, they don't even really need a judge's ruling not to turn it over, but they're respectful, um, and the judges normally do grant those requests because they're very limited. So we get everything, and we get it early on in the case. Now, early on is after indictment, which is still a month in to the case, okay? So I mean, an optimal situation would be to get everything on day one because surveillance videos, for example, are only usually good for about a week. Most places that have surveillance going usually retape over their, you know, whatever they've seen, whatever, you know, is on the tape, they retape it. Um, so if you don't get out there in the first week, now normally we go out anyway because we usually know where the incident happened and we try to find surveillance. But what happens is sometimes even the, the specifics <coughs> of the location can be very different um, in a complaint or it can be very vague in the initial complaint. And then when you get the actual police reports, there's a lot more specificity, like it was in front of this particular store or, you know, one thing is on the corner, another thing is in front of a certain address. But the police reports will be really specific. And um, we may have lost a chance to get video. That's just one example. Um, we don't do a lot of pre-indictment plea bargaining, but we do do some. And that takes place within the first week. And we do not get anything in that first week. So although it's early in the scheme of things, and it's complete in the scheme of things, I will give you an example of why it's not the perfect system. Um, the detectives that uh, Mr. Levy was just talking about, so they wrote up the canvas. Those pa that paperwork didn't even go with the package, the initial package that went when the person was arrested that went to the DA's office. So sometimes no police reports go, but let's assume that the arresting officer had a complete package of police reports that they brought to the, you know, when the person was arrested. The detectives didn't do their work until three days later. So there is no requirement that the detectives then send their reports to the DA, right? The DA has to request them, and the DA has to notice that there were other police reports. And one of the problems that occurs is really a DA not even knowing maybe that there may be more of an investigation that happened after the arrest or later on in the case, because sometimes that's going on parallel to the prosecution. And so I think it, those are the kinds of things that tend to get delayed longer and longer until oftentimes we're the ones that figure out, you know, I think there was a detective involved in this case. I see a reference in, you know, some esoteric little spot that, to a DD-5, and, you know, can we get those? And then the DA sometimes has trouble. I mean, I don't want to short, I don't want to give short shrift to the DA problems that they have, which I'm sure they'll talk about, getting information from the police department. There's like, you know, definitely a divide because that is not automatically just constantly sent. Right. Um, in, the, in the Brooklyn DA's office, do, do they um, continually uh, update you with, with new information as it comes in, or is it just like one dump at the beginning and then we'll, we'll see a trial? No, they will continually update. Um, I mean, still, even at trial, sometimes we still get, I mean, we would never get six inches of material, but especially a complicated case, it's often true that we get something at the last minute, but it's mostly because they didn't have it either, which is another separate problem. So we've asked the district attorney's offices to provide any written policies that they have regarding their own discovery rules or procedures. D does, does Brooklyn have, has, has it reduced this policy to any kind of written format where um, you could go to the, the DA and say, hey, you're not, you're not adhering to section two of your policy. Um, okay, I think it's more complicated uh, by the fact that we've had so many different DAs in the last few years than anything else. I can tell you that under Joe Hines, I had a letter written by him with a list of all the stuff we're supposed to get, signed by him, a personal original letter, and it was on, 
I actually had it taped onto the door of my office so that if anybody didn't get something on that list, they could take a handwritten letter and bring it to court and they could get whatever they needed. Um, there is something called a, you know, a stipulation that was written also you know, under the Heinz era that was actually negotiated about all the different things they're supposed to turn over, which is a very complete list. You know, it goes, it's very extensive and it really does cover most of what anybody would need. Um, and however, you know, the, the bindingness of that, the validity of it, I'm pretty sure that Eric Gonzalez is going to draft his own new policy. You know, he's just got elected and, and sworn in in the last few months. Why do they not, why do they not apply these, uh, this procedure to homicide cases, do you I know? I think you, you need to ask them that question. Okay. Um, one of the things that I have heard from the DAs, and um, intuitively I think it is a very compelling argument, that it, it's hard enough to get victims and witnesses to participate in these trials to show up um, there's a tremendous amount of witness intimidation that is out there. The city, frankly, and the state does a very poor job of protecting witnesses. Um, what kind of standards do you see being applied when the Brooklyn DA's office goes for a protective order? I assume the protective orders are almost always to protect the identity of a, of a witness or what what's that conversation like with the court? What is what is the court looking for the DAs to show that um, would justify withholding the identity of a witness? And um, and do you? It's usually not the sensitivity of the witness or the victim, you know, and their concern about anybody knowing their name. It's usually a legitimate you know basis of knowledge that there is truly some sort of threat to that person. And I can tell you it's normally, um, let's say a gang situation where it is a known entity and that you have one gang against another and they know that if they actually give the name of that person, that that person is legitimately in, in danger. And when I talk about that, the sensitivity of the witness, of course, is important to all of us. But I will tell you that on sex crimes, they do turn over the discovery. Okay, and in my experience, it does not in any way impair their witnesses' willingness, their witnesses willingness to come forward. Many of these cases are sensitive for a lot of other reasons that have absolutely nothing to do with that person's fear of somebody knowing who they are, okay? Because that can be easily protected. We can have a name but no address. It's easy to find out who it was. So many cases involve people that know each other to start with. It is quite easy in many cases, you know, to sort of figure out what's going on. And the, the witnesses, you know, there's a culture of not coming forward in Brooklyn. You know, Brooklyn has, I would say, I'm just going to put it out there, like the worst cases in the city. You know, most serious, harsh, you know, scary cases, really. I mean, just to put it out there. And to be able to do this in a borough like that, really tells you that that is unrealistic to worry about people coming forward in other boroughs because the problem of people coming forward is not about fear of safety. It is really very complex and it's not about that, in my opinion. Could, could each of you address that because it is such a central argument sure. from the district attorneys. Sure, so the first thing I would say is 46 other states, including North Carolina and Texas, the other bastion of progressiveness, um, have done this, and actually in the New York State Bar Association Task Force um, that was made up of defense attorneys, judges, and prosecutors, they called the prosecutors from other jurisdictions who said, we don't have, it. We don't have an issue. And if we did, we would change it. I'm also going to say, while they are saying that it is a problem in the city and state, I point to Kings County again to say, if that were a problem, the Brooklyn DA is voluntarily doing this, they can go back to the way the other four do it tomorrow. So I sort of raise that to say, we've heard this fear mongering and dog whistling for a really long time. I wanna raise this. At some point, if the system is providing the due process that my colleague from New York County talked about under the Constitution, there would be a trial. 
That means the person has to come into court. So this notion that they can't share a name of somebody who ultimately is going to be a witness in court really should paint for you the picture that they don't want to actually turn it over before then. Because really what it is, is it's a strategy to take a plea so that the witness perhaps never comes to court. Now I'm not saying that their duty is not to protect witnesses. I am saying that there are ways in which to do it. So the New York State Bar Association, because there were district attorneys and judges on that commission, actually highlighted not only protective orders, but a few other measures that could be done right now to actually protect witnesses in those very limited cases. First of all, you can carve out, as the New York State Bar Association plan does, gang cases. It also carves out homicides and sex crimes. And while we don't agree to that, because I do think we have a duty, regardless of the severity of the charge, there are those protections. There is moving for a protective order. There is them making an application to a judge that they will turn it over to defense counsel for the purposes of our investigation and so that we understand the um, likelihood of a conviction so that we can advise our clients. And then the judge could order us not to share that information with our client until there is a trial in essence, gag ordering us, and that, because a judge ordered it, would mean I don't have to turn it over and I can still be effective under the Sixth Amendment. Or, if there is an issue about providing me not only a name or an address, or a name where I would get an address, because they don't want people to be disclosing a home address, the New York State Bar Association plan allows for them to call the witness to their office for me as defense counsel without my client to go talk to the witness so I do not know the home address until it is relevant. Therefore, I can talk to a witness face to face and I would do it without my client. So there are protections. So when we hear about fear mongering and witness tampering, I am going to pause again to say you have to dig deep and I ask you to do so. I would welcome the perspective of the practitioners in the Bronx and Manhattan on the issue of witness intimidation. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, an, it's not a problem. It just isn't. I mean, I mean, there are very few prosecutions for intimidating a witness. The vast majority of cases don't involve a civilian complainant. Um, that has to be protected. To run an entire discovery practice that affects, you know, in Manhattan, 100,000 people a year based on this incredibly rare occurrence and to center your practice around, you know, this fear, um, it, it makes no sense whatsoever, in my opinion. So I think it's just a, a, a talking point that's disingenuous. I, I echo the comments of my, my colleagues. We don't see a rash of charges of, uh, of witness intimidation. and. And what I, th what I think you see, too, um, um, among the boroughs is, you know, you have the model of, of Brooklyn DA, you know, counter, uh, put up, juxtaposed with the Manhattan DA. The Bronx is somewhere in the middle. We do get information, but it comes in drips and drabs. There is no sort of set policy. There is no sort of predictability in the process. But we do get information sort of along the way. Most of what we get is on the eve of trial, but we do, there is sharing of information. It is haphazard and unpredictable, but it happens. Um, and there is no, there is no, there are no concerns, generally speaking, about sort of witness intimidation. And when there is, those issues are raised and dealt with in a common sense way. I think, you know, judges are very sensitive to claims that somebody is being uh, intimidated and will take swift action, right, if there's a credible reason to believe that there's a problem. Um, I think the right approach to discovery generally is to say, turn everything over unless there's a good reason not to. And judges are very open to listening to those good reasons. If there's a good reason not to turn it over, judges will order that it not be turned over or that it be turned over in a modified way, um, you know, as, as we've already sort of discussed. Um, the, the argument that a blanket prohibition or, a, you know, a, a blanket policy of not turning things over, uh, you know, is, is just too expansive and too far-reaching to, 
to credibly counter uh, what is a very narrow and, um, and small problem. I just want to add one thing. We have never had a judge say no to a DA who asked for, you know, not to disclose discovery. Now, legally, I don't know that they could, but no judge has ever said, oh, I don't agree with you. They always respect the DA because they know that the district attorney knows information that, that they are sharing or sometimes can't share. Sometimes there's stuff that happens in the DA's office that they know about that they can't share. And we do find that, for the most part, that they act in good faith and they don't come forward and say that they have a reason in a particular case not to turn it over that they can't share for some reason when, they're, when, they, when that's not true. That is just not something that happens and not something that judges are really questioning. You know, you must turn it over unless you tell me. Um, there's the option of also doing it ex parte. They could talk to a judge privately, with, you know, not in the presence. And again, you're talking about the most extreme situation where there's a real reason to believe there was an actual threat already made. At that point, the defense defers to those conversations because it's so limited. It happens so rarely. Right? And so, you know, because we don't have sort of the tail wagging the dog in Brooklyn, we, the, you know, that piece of it gets handled extremely efficiently, respectfully, and in a way that I think never jeopardizes the, anybody. Um, we're going to go to my colleagues and then I'll ask a questions to, to, to wrap up this, this panel. I'll just make the observation. The district attorneys, the public defenders, the Department of Corrections, and so far they're impacted. That's all funded by New York City. And we have a lot of skin in the game in this system being fair and efficient. <clears throat> when we loop back around to me, I'm going to ask each of you the extent to which, if any, the issue of speedy trial, wrongful convictions, um, are impacted by the state's discovery rules and the DA practices that exist now. But for now, Council Member Andy King. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I applaud and appreciate all of you for coming out today and giving us your testimony and your information um, in regards to discovery and the problems with discovery. Um, I have pretty much one question, but I just wanted to put something on the record. Um, and I ask, I don't know where everyone stands who in the room today, where you are when it comes to discovery, but I just ask each and every one of you, whatever your position is, to be an advocate for open and early discovery. Um, as I understand it, um, you know, I even have a resolution in um, repealing Criminal Procedure Law 240 and, and, and putting in place um, a piece of legislation, the legal aid has done research on 245, which is something that requires open early discovery because if someone is innocent from the start, then they should not spend a day or two days in jail while the system figures it out. Um, I believe that the system is flawed, as we all know and believe that it is flawed. Um, I also believe it's organized to keep people incarcerated. I believe that, you know, when we start to talk about this country and, in, and the incarceration rules, I always take it back to the mother doctrine of the Constitution, the three-fifth clause, whereas when it stopped being, quote, unquote, being implemented, and as you said it to people of color who always get mistreated when it comes to the system, well, it was designed from day one. And even when they implemented the 13th Amendment, it, all, it only said that slavery is illegal in the Union unless you're in prison. So slavery goes by the day of incarceration today. And that means what all the rules and policies that have been in place has been designed to make, designed to make sure there's an incarceration system that stays in place for profit and, just, and, and a way to oppress a certain set of Americans in this country. So I say to each and every one of you, what are you going, what can we do, continue to do together to reveal it? Because I once heard that you should have a jury by your peers, but why is it we have a system in America that kind of negotiates against that? You know, that the, it's almost like we will advocate against you not going to court, but we want to advocate the art of the deal. You know, so people never get their day in court. When I hear 90% of people trial cases never go to trial, then what is this rule that I, should, I have the right to go before a jury of my peers to hear what's against me? So if there are systems in place, there's rules in place to make sure that early discovery is never in place. It's designed to make sure that you keep your system of incarceration in place. 
and that's unfair to the American people. It's unfair, especially to those people who have been subjected to the 13th Amendment and the Three-Fifth Clause. And, that's, and I believe it always goes back to the beginning. And until we kill the root up to the beginning, we'll always have these policies in place that will trip you up in order to save and help people who are innocent. And I, I thought we were innocent until proven guilty, but people sit in jail for months until they are able to be heard to find out whether or not they are, whether they're innocent or guilty. So something's flawed. So we need to make sure that early discovery is part of the system, and it should be one universal system. Brooklyn should be operating this different than Staten Island. Staten Island should be operating differently than Rockland County. Rockland County can't be operating different than Schenectady. I mean, everyone across the state of New York needs to operate under one system. And I believe if we do that, then we can really find true fairness in our system. But we need to take out the prejudicial mandates that was in from day one in the Constitution that still is the underlying factor of why we have so many um, hurdles with the jobs that you're trying to do to keep New Yorkers and the population in the state of New York free. So that's my comment, and I'm looking forward to us having a more a robust conversation on um, you know, early and speedy trials, and as well as the resolution that we have repealing criminal procedure law 240 and, and, imply, and implement it with something that just makes sense. Because if we're looking to do the right thing, then we will do the right thing. If it's about locking people up by, because we want to protect the system, well, when does the, success, the system protect the people? Right now, it's not protecting the people. And I thank you, and I thank you, Mr. Chair, for your, giving me the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Councilmember King. Um, Councilmember Rose, do you have questions? Councilmember Cohen. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I'm going to just uh, let the cat out of the bag that I, I do. Uh, I was a past sponsor or co-sponsor of uh, of Councilman King's resolution, so um, I know how I feel. But I, I'm just trying to get a sense of uh, sort of the weight of the problem, I guess. In that, uh, you know, uh, one of you made a, a passionate uh, argument about the effectiveness of council, but. There's, there's a difference between counsel and the client. I mean, in, in some ways, like, you, you know, if, if I were going to plead guilty, uh, I, ha I don't need discovery as the client. I know what, you, what, if I did it or I didn't do it, and I plead guilty, I'm aware that when I make that plea, I have the knowledge as the client. I understand that, that you are not in a position to advise the client of, but in terms of guilt or innocence, I mean, I'm just curious, to, if, in your opinion, I mean, if you see it, or if you believe in your practice, that there's a lot of people pleading guilty who are, in fact, innocent because they don't have discovery? Or is it really just, and I, again, I, I'm completely sympathetic and, and I understand that you know, having effective counsel is vitally important, but it, it would be significantly more outrageous than it is already if, we, if it was leading to, I think, a significant number of people pleading guilty who are not guilty. So could you just talk to that for a second? Let me take uh, that I, one. I mean, I don't know what, uh, a, what a significant number would be, but I mean, there's no question that um, the discovery practices as currently constituted gravely increase the risk of wrongful convictions. There's, because, as I said, by, by reducing the effectiveness of, of your attorney foremost, but also by, uh, as pointed out by my colleague from Bronx Offenders, you know, there's tangible evidence, obviously, that um, a, a strong contributor, and I believe uh, someone from the Innocence Project is going to speak later, a strong contribution to false, uh, uh, to wrongful convictions in this country are, you know, misconduct with respect to o turning over evidence by prosecutors. And what happens is when you create a situation like this where you have a, a DA's office, as in Manhattan, saying we're just going to do the bare minimum, we're going to barely just comply with the statute, you create a culture where what's prized is strategy and leverage uh, towards a game, gaming a result more than justice, which is what a prosecutor is charged with seeking. You create a game situation. You create the playing of games, the hiding of certain things. I'm making this offer, a DA will tell you, but you have to tell me by the next court date. Well, how can you advise a client whether or not to take this offer that's going to you know, affect the next decade of their lives when Unbeknownst to you, the DA has been not handing you grand jury testimony where maybe the complainant expresses significant doubt as to an identification or um, maybe sets forth a self-defense claim. Because there have been countless times in my career where I've said to a client, oh, I can't believe this client's not taking this plea. Suddenly I get that six-inch pile I've been telling you about and I say, oh, I see now why the client has been so reluctant. There are tangible problems with this case not just problems in a strategic sense, actual doubts about, you know, 
the way the DA has been portraying this case, portraying a complainant who saw perfectly, who is 100% confident, I'm looking at the grand jury minutes. Now I understand why my client's been so reluctant to take this offer that, to me, seemed good. So it cuts both ways. Many times our clients understand that there are all these weaknesses in the case, and we are kind of inured to that after decades of saying, yeah, well, you're not being realistic. Get the police reports. Oh, boy, I'm really glad that the client didn't take a plea in this case. So it's, it's less about, you know, the Hollywood guilt or innocence and more about dignity um, for our Constitution, respect for the criminal justice system. Um, you know, this current format greatly reduces respect for our criminal justice system. I went to an event in Monroe College um, sponsored by Discovery for Justice, and it was a packed auditorium. There was anger in the community, mostly people of color who have seen, you know, loved ones go serve long sentences without ever having been shown, without ever having read a police report on their case. Tangible anger in that audience. Tangible anger from our clients to us. Um, as my colleague from Legal Aid pointed out, the situation where a client calls his lawyer and says, well, let's start talking about a plea, and the lawyer says to them, um, I don't have that information. You know, that's not the end of that interaction. The client doesn't believe you're being honest with them. They, they attribute bad faith to you or laziness or apathy. They don't want to hear that that's the system and that there's nothing we can do to change it. They blame us. Case has been going on for eight months. How can you still not show me a police report? I've had a variation of that conversation probably 5,000 times in my life. And they don't, and, and, and many times they do point to, my cellmate uh, has seen everything a month into the case. You look up the, the, the person they're talking about, sure enough, Kings County, right? How do you explain to a client facing a decade in prison that you know, if, if they had been arrested over the Brooklyn Bridge, it would be a totally different situation and you can give them tangible, um, informed advice, but because they're in Manhattan, you can't. Can I, can I just address that? Because I want, I want to ask, answer just like a little more specifically. You know, it's, it's very easy to think somebody's either innocent or guilty and they know, but there are so many variations on that. Um, and, you know, we've obviously spent our entire careers analyzing those issues, but I'll give you a few examples. You, you might have, let's say, stabbed somebody with a knife. It may be, you know you did it, but it may be self-defense. And that's a nuanced conversation that you need to have with your own client and that that person needs to have with themselves when they're being offered a certain plea. And let's say that um, there are five witnesses that say, yes, it was definitely self-defense. I mean, then you know that 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 as a lawyer you can say to that person you know you should go to trial because you know you're going to win this trial because you're right you you are innocent but it's a legal innocence right because you did stab the person but then if you know there are five witnesses that tell a story that's a little different than what you know your client is saying you might say to that person well that's a big risk if you go to trial you're probably going to lose now keep in mind that when you have two people in an incident even if five people said one thing or five said the other, doesn't even mean that's, you know, it's a game of telephone, right? You don't even know what really happened. And so when we, you know, when we talk, it, it's, it, it's very, um, it's tempting to basically say the person knows what they did, but there's so much more because there, are, for example, I mean, I give you, there's a story in her testimony about a client who actually did go into a store and steal uh, items from the store, but he was so drunk that he doesn't remember it. And so, um, look, do I think that's the greatest thing in the world that the guy's so drunk he doesn't remember it? No. But when you read the story, you understand that the original allegations was that he took some items and took money from the cash register. But when we eventually got the information, we, found, we saw in the surveillance he never took money from the cash register. He took food. And with that, and with him knowing and getting to see that surveillance himself, or the police reports, I can't remember right now, um, he was able to get to a place where he recognized um, what he needed to do. And by the way, the district attorney also recognized that they needed to reconsider their offer. And now he took drug treatment, and he successfully complete, completed treatment. And that's a net gain for everybody. So there's a lot of gray area in whether somebody did or didn't do something. And um, I just want to also add, let us not um, forget that when somebody didn't do something, that those are the people that are getting hurt the most by this process. 
So they know they didn't take, do something, and they refuse a plea in a case where the mandatory minimum is five years in jail if they get convicted. And they're making this decision. They might have a probationary plea in front of them, and they're innocent, and they have a chance to walk away from this without ever worrying about going to jail, which is the horrible, the worst thing that could ever happen to somebody who's innocent. And we can't even tell them, uh, don't take this plea, which will you know, I impact your job, your life, for the rest of your life, because we can't say, look, you are innocent, but we, we have no idea what the evidence is going to look like at the trial, and what's your chance to be vindicated. So I, I think we, we should remember that that is one part of the analysis that the person knows, but the innocent person is the one who knows the least about what actually happened during that incident. So that's the per person, excuse me, that gets hurt the most. I, I guess, yeah. I guess what I'm just trying to get a feel for, and you know, we're looking at it systemically, and I understand that if you're the individual who's looking at serious time, that or, or any time, uh, that it's profoundly important to you. But looking at it systemically, I'm just trying to get a, a handle on: is this, in terms of impacts and, and outcomes, is this an enormous problem? Is it a relatively small problem? Uh, in terms of uh, uh, I, I don't know if you can speak to this, uh, uh, but disposition times. Uh, it, it, does Kings County, ha it, are you much like, more likely to get a, a disposition in a significantly quicker in, in Kings County than you are in the other four counties? We did an informal study in our office because there are some cases where we don't get discovery. And we found out that the cases where we get discovery is a six-month difference in resolution time versus the cases that don't get discovery. Does anybody know, though, uh, from county to county, it, it, from arraignment to disposition, is, is the time significantly different in Queens versus Brooklyn or the Bronx? Well, in Queens, versus? as I talked to you about the, the, their waiver policy, often, um, often you're not even seeing an indictment because you're waiving, you, your client is sort of waiving to try to get a deal because if they don't waive, they will be indicted and then no deal. So those times skew uh, Queens in a way that I think is, has to really be looked at, um, and then the other boroughs. Yeah, it's true. The other the other thing that the, that those there is, and I think this leads to um, the chairman's sort of question about sort of looking at this as a comprehensive issue: bail and speedy trial. Um, there are times. There were times, despite my client being in, I had to say, Judge, I need an adjournment because. I have just gotten DNA reports, right, a week before trial. Now I need to get an expert. Um, in fact, in some cases, and they were highlighted both in the New York Times, but in here, we didn't get the DNA reports until after the jury was picked. So imagine that. You know, to talk about sort of the systemic problem, I, I want us to hopefully look at this as a justice issue. And I often compare criminal discovery with civil discovery. So some people may practice, uh, who are lawyers, practice in the civil world. We actually don't look at it from a who's at fault and who's not at fault, or who did the malpractice and who didn't. The fact is, on civil matters, when money is the outcome, or fault, civil fault, is what you're deciding. You're not deciding guilt or innocence. So we're not saying you're just because you're guilty you sh you, and it, there's, there's not an innocence problem, we shouldn't change the system. That civil system provides for interrogatories, questions you ask your opponent that are fully asked, depositions where you are meeting the client and questioning them outside of trial on the record, you have pretrial evidentiary hearings where the judge orders turning over, and if not, you can move for preclusion at trial or summary judgment of an issue. That's when money is at stake. If liberty is at stake, I want us to pause to say the calculation on justice is not, is this unfair to innocent people? The calculus is, is this unfair to the system? And the question there is yes. I can just address your question. One of the tricky parts about answering your question is that because our discovery system is so broken, we don't know what we don't know, right? So it's, it's, it's in some sense an unanswerable question because as sort of wrongful conviction cases show, there is a world of evidence out there that is just kept hidden from view. 
it comes to light in a handful of cases, right, where a conviction is overturned. And if you read those cases, you always see that there's some sp very specific set of facts and some, you know, dogged family member who for years went after this case and found the one thing that sort of broke everything open, right? But we shouldn't have to depend on that to reveal what we don't know, right? And, and the, the trouble, again, with, with the question is, you know, how many people are pleading guilty when they shouldn't have pled guilty? We'll never be able to answer that because we don't know, right? We'll, we, we don't know what we don't know. And, and without, without having full transparency, it's a sort of an unanswerable question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Rose. I just have one very simple question. Are these restrictive discovery laws keeping you from being the most effective, um, providing the most effective defense for your clients? Yes. <laughs> thank you. Simple, an simple question, simple answer, I think. Mm -hmm. Without question, absolutely. And, and that's outrageous. And, and in so doing this, since you are tasked with defending them and, and providing them with the most information that allows them to make an informed decision about the rest of their lives, you are, in essence, without the adequate discovery, you are um, a party to fueling the pipeline to prison. Would you say that's so? We have no choice but to say yes to that. Do we want to say yes to that? Absolutely no. not. Absolutely not. Do, do the 1,200 public defenders of legal aid society and our colleagues in each one of our offices and frankly our colleagues throughout this state Want to, want to practice like this? No. Mm -hmm. But if we look at it as this is what we have, and in the moment we have to act on the best interest of our client, and if that is to waive, unfortunately, months upon months to try to get a deal in Queens without having any discovery, that's in the best interest of the client. We have to do that. And if you want to provide the best defense for um, a client, you now then um, sort of become party to them no longer having a speedy trial because if I'm correct, I heard you say you now have to ask for an adjournment to try to, um, to provide the best That's type right. of defense for your client. That's right. Because so now, that the stakes are that high. And the options are either, you know, the pipeline to prison or delayed justice. That's right. And when you look at it also in terms of bail, the providing of information earlier to us allows us, could allow us, and often if we get it, for instance, through our own means. I find out information and I get an investigator and they go out and I believe that there is a change of circumstance. I am going to make a bail application to reduce that person's bail and, or get them out. I can't do that or I can do it more if I had the information earlier to make a real change. And so it is as we have said in Albany, and as we have said, it is a comprehensive approach to criminal justice reform, and discovery helps in all matters, whether it's speedy trial or looking at bail and the assessment of bail and that decision by a judge that is made in New York City 24 hours after arraignment with very little information based on just, just the application of the prosecutor and the information provided in the prosecutor but without any real evidence. If I had then within five, ten days after that given the information, I can go back and do a bail application and say 24 hours, now there's more information, judge, release my client on their own recognizance. But I can't. I can't. And speedy trial, I can't. Uh, so it is the linchpin 
Providing us information is the linchpin for us to do what is right by our client. And we, in all of our offices, have gotten really creative to do more for our clients with the very inf little information. And you just, you need the tools to do your job effectively. We, we need that information, clearly. Thank you. You know, I don't know what's gonna happen up in Albany, obviously, and whether or not there's, this is going to be the year. Um, but one thing that we might be contemplating would be, as we have funded Vera to do, or CCI to do different studies and, and different pilots, and Vera's embarking on a pilot uh, related to, to bail and the information that's available to judges and everyone involved. Um, you know, if there were a, um, a study to be done that the council were to, were to fund that would examine how discovery practices in the different jurisdictions were impacting speedy trial, wrongful convictions, you know, X number of people that are at Rikers that maybe wouldn't be, et cetera. Um, would that be a fruitful endeavor on our part? I would, of course, looking at it and data is critical. Um, you know, as, as public defenders, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice has uh, asked me for us and all of us, but certainly for, uh, under our contracts to provide them lots of information about how we effectively represent our clients, right? From, you know, looking at how many investigators and social workers and paralegals we have, to the training of our lawyers, to um, how many bail applications, what motions you're filing, right? They, you know, what is the, you know, have you taken a plea on the top charge? Have you taken, taken pleas? How many clients have you put in the grand jury? Like, this is all information that both the city and the state have asked. And uh, for those of us who ha practice in Manhattan and the Bronx, the first department uh, indigent defense um, organization oversight committee, it's a mouthful, IDOC, every two years asks us all of these questions, both anecdotally and data, to ensure that the public defenders of this city are doing right by our clients because we are contracted to do so and mandated to do so. What data is collected on the discovery practices, on how they have asked for, why they, what their policies are for asking for bail, what their policies are for asking for adjournments, there's a whole host of things. They are funded by this city the same as we are. And we know that the number of low-level uh, misdemeanors are, have been trending down because of the efforts and the reform efforts of this council, public defenders, and the district attorneys, and the mayor's office of criminal justice. While we're having conversations, and I'll t this is a preview to the budget testimony coming up, but as uh, we're talking to the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and we're hearing things like, well, you may not need that much funding because that's many, right? DA's budgets don't actually do that. And so the real question is, so you have less cases, so are you really doing an active look at the cases you do have, turning over the information? Because I am going to also say the same way we are required to analyze our cases from day one should be that of the district attorney. And this idea that I don't have to turn over discovery until trial, I have friends who are district attorneys or former district attorneys, and we know our, our colleagues who are in the defense bar who are former district attorneys who admit, because I didn't have to turn anything over, because I knew trial was a year away, I didn't really have to talk to my witness right away after the grand jury. I didn't have to check in with them. I didn't have to ask the police officers to turn over the stuff. That's why in Lisa's case in Brooklyn and in our office, we get it on a regular basis because they're under an obligation, voluntarily by the way, but an ob obligation and a promise to do so. They turn it over because they're asking for it more regularly, the four other boroughs are not. And so you're not really analyzing your case. So you don't know actually if you're for instance, your complainant no longer wants to come or has changed their story and the young man is sitting at Rikers for three years. You don't know that until you unfortunately know it and it's too late. What, if, yes, sir. Well, I, I would just, I just, let me just recognize we've been joined by the public advocate, Letitia James. Uh, just on the question of doing a study, 
Discovery practices is the one place where you already have a natural experiment occurring right now. Generally, when you're doing one of these studies, one of the hard parts of designing a study is finding con a control group and an experimental group, right? With Brooklyn, you have that. You've had a natural experiment ongoing for decades, and you can see. Well, let me so let me press you on that. Do, do you have questions? Okay, let me let me press you on that. <clears throat> Um, the open file discovery at the Brooklyn DA's office has been in place for some time now, right? It, it started with, with DA Hines. Can we say that there have been fewer wrongful convictions in Brooklyn than in the other jurisdictions? Can we say that speedy trial is more real in Brooklyn than other jurisdictions? Can we say that Brooklyn has sent fewer people or had fewer people sitting on Rikers Island um, for want of being able to intelligently negotiate a, a plea, and how would that control group work out? How would, how would that, that study work out? I mean, my only concern is that there are so many factors that go into a lot of those things. Um, my understanding is that Brooklyn, in general, does resolve cases. You know, when you look at the whole package, it tends to resolve cases at the bottom end. Like, if you look at the Bronx, they may take three years. You know, we'll look at Brooklyn, and it'll be like nine months or, you know, six months or something like that. I would say it's probably related to the discovery practice, but it's very hard to, you know, separate that out from, you know, for example, bail practices are judge-dependent. Uh, you know, there's a lot of other issues that play into it. So, I, I, look, I'm not against the study, and, of course, we would be very happy to cooperate and work on a study. Um, I just found it really hard to, you know, Imagine, I mean, a lot of work has been done on this issue already, and I think what we need is action and probably not more studies. I don't oppose a study, but I feel like sometimes studies are used as a way to delay action, and I feel like we have delayed this a long time, and that may not be the, the best solution. I would be really interested, just to say, I would be really interested in some conversation with the police department about their potential role in this as well. Because, I, for example, in North mm -hmm. Carolina, you know, you, when you get, fi find out you have a case, you actually go to the police department and they give you the file. You know, it's not always required that everything goes through the DAs. So I think there's a space there where we could really talk about more than just this. So, so one of the things that we are very interested in um, coming out of this hearing is the possibility of passing legislation requiring the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to convene all the stakeholders, as it does in other circumstances, whether it's uh, trying to uh, clear the backlog of cases that are at Rikers Island um, or other issues, um, the DAs, the public defenders, the police, whoever else, and try to establish, a, um, obviously voluntarily, because the, the DAs are independently elected officials, but some kind of standard of best practices for New York City. I, I served in the Assembly. It's it's difficult to pass legislation that is as uh, equally relevant and vital in Brooklyn as in Ximang County. And um, if we don't see action in Albany uh, this year, uh, we might think it makes sense to really force the issue, at least here in New York City, to the extent that we can, and try to get to uh, uniform practices that are recognized as being what in 2018 um, should be an appropriate way for uh, criminal prosecutions to be, to be handled. And, and so that's, um, <clears throat> that would be the opportunity to bring the PD and certainly district attorneys and the public defenders and, and whoever else into that, uh, into that conversation and, 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 and force a result that we, we may not be able to get out of Albany. With that, Madam Public Advocate. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so as a, for full disclosure, former legal aid attorney, former public defender, um, uh, and uh, someone obviously who's committed to justice. Um, so the question was already asked, and that was the consistency in the city of New York, and it's my understanding that there's open file discovery in Brooklyn, but the other, bro all the other boroughs unfortunately lag behind. Um, so the open file discovery, at what juncture does that come into play? when a, a case is marked ready for trial or? No, we get our discovery shortly after indictment. Okay, and, um, uh, is, and that is not the practice in the other five boroughs? 
And, it, and does it only apply to misdemeanors and uh, or to both misdemeanors and felonies? It's for misdemeanors and felonies. Mm -hmm. So the other boroughs that no no open file discovery. No, large, largely n no. Um, you know, as as we s sort of mentioned bef before, the you know there is. Er I can think of cases in which I've pressed and district attorneys will turn over things, but as a principle, it is not happening. And in the few instances, such as in Manhattan, and there is some recent conversation on Staten Island that they want to make changes, by and large, it is only if you have a date certain, for instance, in Manhattan, a date certain for trial. Um, which does not help 90% of our clients who plea very uh, at before trial, long before trial. Um, only in some instances and in some felony cases with lots of exclusions and the suggestions coming out of Staten Island are basically a right of redaction that would meaning, make any document meaningless. And we apparently in New York and New York State are our we have more restrictive discovery statute than Texas, Alabama, North Carolina, and 43 other states. Is that true? 46. Uh, 46. 46. Rick Perry, when he was the governor of Texas, uh, changed the discovery laws. I want uh, us to pause on that. Rick Perry changed his discovery laws. For him, according to the statements he made when he did it, was that if Texas was going to be a law and order state, where they were going to put people away for many, many years, he was going to ensure that due process was at least given. And these other 46 states, as far as you know, do they, uh, can you get discovery through the police department, or is that just an anomaly in that one particular state that you mentioned? Well, you know, obviously it varies, yeah. um, but the thing I think is most important to know is that there's a nationwide trend, and it's always towards greater discovery. So none of these 46 states, um, and this is similar to the Brooklyn DA's office, they've never come back and said, oh, we made a mistake. We need to roll back. We need to make our discovery more restrictive. I think whatever the data ultimately turns out to be, it'll still remain true that the Brooklyn DA's office has never uh, backtracked on that policy. They've never said, oh, we've made a mistake. Manhattan was right. Um, look, at, look at what's happening in terms of witness interference or look at what's happening here. We're now going to, and, and they're free to do that since they, they can comply with the statute. What they're doing is largely voluntarily, so they can easily back. You've never seen that, and you've never seen any other state that has opened their discovery laws come back later and say, well, you know, that was a mistake. We're, we're going to take that back. So it's a nationwide trend, and, and unfortunately, New York is at the, at the rock bottom somehow. But you know what, what is really concerning to me is that um, under the former district attorney in Brooklyn, Thompson, uh, he formulated this uh, uh, conviction review panel, and we've uncovered a number of individuals who are wrongfully convicted. Uh, it's been primarily focused in Brooklyn. All the attention has been on Brooklyn, and it's continued under the leadership of Eric Gonzalez. And so the question is, once we begin to review these cases in the other borough, boroughs, what we will uncover, what we, we will discover. Will the number of wrongful convictions exceed that in the, in, in the borough of Brooklyn? Well, I mentioned this earlier and how a lot of research has been done on, you know, the higher incidence of, let's call it, you know, the, the, the lack of open disclosure to the defense of material by the DA and how that contributes. Mm -hmm. And there's other people who you'll be hearing from who are in better position to, to elucidate that, but it, it is certainly a factor in many wrongful convictions is whether you want to call it a Brady violation or late disclosure or non-disclosure of material that somehow could have assisted the, the defense. And I understand your concern about analysis to the point of paralysis. I join with you in that. But if it's going to convince, and I would imagine it's the state senate which is holding up this bill as opposed to the assembly, whatever evidence that we can put forward, uh, whatever um, uh, um, analysis that we can put forward to convince them that this is that um, this is a step in the right direction, I think will go a long way. Does anyone know where the governor stands on this? Does, has he stated a position with respect to reform in this area? So the governor in his state of the state and in the budget placed um, not only bail reform front and center, but also discovery and speedy trial, and talked about how this is really a racial justice issue. And he continues, uh, to 
press that this is a comprehensive approach. Um, and we know that both the Assembly and the S Senate minority have also enacted, uh, it proposed in their one house, um, bail discovery and speedy trial as a comprehensive package. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, we hope that all three prevail um, because they, it's as, as with discovery, as I said before, is a linchpin to helping us obviously right. both in terms of ne ne sort of negotiate for our clients, move, you know, move to trial quicker or hearings, make those critical decisions as well as making bail applications when people are in. We need that information in order to do it, which is why it was talked about as comprehensive. So here we are in New York City, and there is a lot of conversation by the district attorneys right. on bail and speedy trial. The conversation we're not hearing is how they can reform discovery too. So it seems to be being left out of the conversation. The only leverage we have, and I thank the chair for his indulgence, the only leverage that we have is the state budget. Do you know whether or not um, this is uh, where this is part of the uh, negotiations with respect to the state budget? It is, in the, it is in the budget, and we anticipate it being a very large conversation when everybody gets into a room together. Thank you. And I hope at some time we can, at some point, um, as you know, um, I've been a proponent of not only uh, uh, reforming criminal discovery practices, but also grand jury practices in the state of New York, because there's been some abuses in that area as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Cohen. Uh, thank you, I, I, again, uh, to be clear, I, I definitely am su uh, completely supportive, but I, I wonder, it, and I don't know, again, it, 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 it appears to be hard to compare apples to apples, county by county, um, uh, but could it an unintended consequence uh, more trials? Is, it, is a trial more likely in Brooklyn than in, in the other counties? Is, it, is there any evidence? No. In I, fact, I, the thing that's most likely is that the right plea is arrived at earlier when everybody has the same information. That, you know, the trial rate is not dramatically different from one county to the other. And I sort of want to also pause to say, you know, as the citywide provider, so I can also look at internally our data on this, there are a lot of reasons why that might be. So it, 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 isn't, it isn't speedy trial. It is, in Brooklyn, for instance, they have had a history of very well alternative to incarceration and detention project programs, particularly for clients with mental illness. Um, that is critical because, as we all know and as we've spoken about, clients are coming to the criminal justice system with a host of life issues um, that have driven them to the front doors of the criminal justice system and will keep them there. So, so availing some, someone availing themselves of the service um, is a longstanding tradition in Brooklyn and the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office supporting that. It is not l likely the case in some of the other boroughs and while there is that, there are, is less and there is some resistance. Um, so I do think you have to look at the totality, and it's clearly not just discovery, right? It isn't that, my, you know, my clients will go to trial in Manhattan or Queens or Staten Island, um, even when we have late disclosure, because they, wa they want to hold the gov government, and we should, to their burden of proving somebody guilty. Um, but there are systemic issues about speedy trial, the lack of judges, right, the uh, routine adjournments, the, right, the imposition of bail that forces a plea, right, because the person wants to get off of Rikers Island. Those are all, those all factor in. You can't look at trials and say that that is what actually we're going to use as the framework as to why we should turn over discovery. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, we have two more panels today. Uh, the closing panel will be our district attorneys, um, but before we hear from them, we will hear uh, from Rebecca Brown at the Innocence Project and Mary Nidaye, I apologize if I'm not saying that correctly, from the Casal Center for Health, Equity, and Justice.
Good morning. Good morning. Bar barely. Almost there. Um, just raise your right hand. Be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, whichever one of you would like to go first. And Mr. Sergeant at Arms, could we get five minutes on the clock? First, I want to uh, thank the committee. I think you need to oh. turn the mic on. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. I'll try that again. I want to thank the committee on the justice system and um, the council member uh, for holding this hearing on a very important part of our criminal justice system, which is discovery in criminal cases. My name is Maureen Jai. I am the senior policy manager at the Catal Center for Health, Equity, and Justice. Uh, the Catal Center is a nonprofit uh, organization. Um, that co-founded and co-directed the Close Vikers campaign through its victory of having Mayor de Blasio um, adopt closing Vikers as a city policy. Um, prior to that, I was a public defender um, right here in Manhattan. I worked for the Legal Aid Society and practiced in 100 Center Street, which is down the block from here. Um, I was there for five years. I represented over 2,000 New Yorkers in misdemeanor and felony cases and I'm submitting my testimony armed with the experiences of my clients over those five years. Um, this is a very important time for New Yorkers when it comes to criminal justice reform. Our mayor, city council, and governor have all committed to closing uh, the Rikers Island jail complex. Um, however, it cannot be overstated that closing Rikers cannot be achieved without critical changes to our pretrial justice practices, and that includes our discovery practices. Uh, as mentioned by um, the former pal palanist, um, including my former boss, Tina Luongo, our current law um, at this moment allows district attorneys to withhold evidence until the day trial begins, and that is often the most important evidence in a case, um, including police statements, grand jury minutes, and the statements of witnesses who would be testifying. Um, and here is how the application of the current law manifested um, in my practice over the last five years. You know, I've been handed grand jury minutes um, on the day of trial and reviewed them and found that they were insufficient, which led to the dismissal of those charges. Um, I've been told by prosecutors on several occasions that I could not receive testimony, I'm sorry, I could not receive evidence until we were in a trial part um, sitting ready to start a trial. Um, that also meant that if for some reason we didn't get a trial part, I, the case would be adjourned again and I would not receive that evidence. I have been handed a stack of material and told, you know, you have five minutes to review this, uh, you know, and then we're going to start this hearing. And I've been handed videos in DWI cases on the day that the district attorney is answering ready on a case and have been told, okay, well, go try this case. Um, <laughs> no, it's not surprising. Um, this was not just in victim cases um, where the prosecutors claimed to be worried about witness safety. This happened in cases that didn't have civilian witnesses. This happened in petit larcenies. Um, this happened in DWIs. Um, even in fair beats, this is turnstile jumps. Um, and in cases where the accused and the complainants are known to each other. So this is not about witness safety. This is about a culture of maintaining advantage by withholding evidence, um, and it's a power play, and unfortunately that power comes at the expense of the people who are innocent until proven guilty. Our current discovery practice uh, undermines our system at every turn. It completely eviscerates the attorney-client relationship and leaves the accused, who often themselves are vi witnesses to crimes or victims of crimes, extremely reluctant to cooperate with law enforcement and prosecutors. Um, people's experiences as defendants do inform how they will behave as victims and witnesses of crimes, and that is the real public safety issue. As previously mentioned, New York is among one of the four states with the most restrictive discovery practices, and Manhattan is one of the boroughs <laughs> with the most restrictive practices here in the five, um, here in New York City. Uh, it is time to bring our discovery practice in line with the rest of the country, with other states like Texas and North Carolina and Missouri, 
where defendants can receive police reports at arraignments. Um, it's also important to note, again, that these states, um, none of them have rolled back their discovery protections, um, and neither has the county of uh, Brooklyn right here in the city. Um, and I think that now is the time for uniform practices across the city that are fair and foster a culture of transparency and not secrecy. And we have alternatives that would achieve that transparency. Currently in the Senate, um, Democrats and the Assembly majority have both released criminal justice packages um, that have proposed changes to bail, speedy trial, and discovery practices. Um, we would urge this um, council to reach out to your colleagues in the State Assembly um, and in the Senate and urge them to pass the best discovery bill possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lanceman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Rebecca Brown. I'm the policy director with the Innocence Project. Uh, the Innocence Project was founded in 1992, and we uh, work to free the innocent who remain incarcerated. We do that through post-conviction DNA testing, and we also work to reform the system to prevent future miscarriages of justice. Um, a total of 241 people have been wrongfully convicted. Uh, those have been revealed in New York State alone. And of those, 30 of those people were proven innocent using post-conviction DNA testing. Many of these cases involved official misconduct, some of which flowed from New York's antiquated and, and frankly, anomalous discovery practices. And for this reason, the Innocence Project has a compelling interest in the improvement of discovery practices here in New York State. Our clients, those people whose innocence were proven, uh, was proven using DNA testing, were convicted of the most serious violent felony crimes, like rape and murder. On average, their innocence wasn't proven until 13 years later after their wrongful conviction. And it's only then that we sometimes discover the extent to which discovery rules and practices stymie justice in their cases. It's simply tragic that the very information that would have prevented their wrongful conviction from occurring in the first place is learned of by the defendant so many years later. And I'd like to share an example from Brooklyn. You heard earlier about how um, Mr. Hines had changed the discovery practices in Brooklyn, and this actually occurred before that change took place. So I think it's interesting to think about that um, in that context. Um, in August of 1989, a 22-year-old named Daryl Rush, who was a drug dealer, was shot to death in Brooklyn. Four days later, the NYPD arrested Jonathan Fleming, a rival drug dealer, in the neighborhood and charged him with murder. Mr. Fleming's alibi was simple. He was in Orlando at the time of the shooting on a family trip to Disney World. During the, tr during the trial, Mr. Fleming's lawyers provided evidence showing that he was in Orlando, including plane tickets, video footage, and vacation photos from the family. But there was a woman who said she was an eyewitness who saw Mr. Fleming pull the trigger from her bedroom window 400 feet away in the dark. So Mr. Fleming was convicted. The only people that provided an alibi for him were family members, and so they were not believed. And right after sentencing, the woman who said he was the trigger man admitted that she was lying, because she had been arrested by police on a larceny charge and was threatened with jail time if she didn't help them to solve this case. Mr. Fleming was given 25 years to life, and 24 years into his sentence, his case was reinvestigated by the Brooklyn DA's office in light of new evidence. Investigators located a phone receipt in the case file. At 9.27 p.m., less than five hours before the murder, Mr. Fleming had paid a phone bill at the Orlando Quality Inn, making it impossible that he would have made it back to Brooklyn in time to kill a man. Even though that receipt was in the police file, it was never given to the defense. And then other evidence was uncovered and was never turned over. There were alibi statements from Quality Inn staff members who remembered Mr. Fleming that were never handed over to the defense. Indeed, Mr. Fleming's defense lawyer never had the phone bill receipt from the hotel, the witness statements from hotel staff, or even information about the charges against the eyewitness who pointed to him as the trigger man. Mr. Fleming's conviction was overturned after 25 years. He was an innocent man, and he suffered a quarter century behind bars for a crime he didn't commit because the defense lacked access to the very information that would have prevented his wrongful conviction. When the state possesses evidence that can help show someone didn't commit a crime, they should be required under law to hand it over and with enough time so it can be used by the defense so they can investigate and put the pieces together. And because of how discovery rules work in New York, innocent people are very likely to plead guilty to crimes they did not commit. So this goes to uh, Council Member Cohen's question earlier um, about do innocent people plead guilty to crimes they didn't commit. 
We know from our DNA-based exonerations, there are 354 in the United States, that 10% of those people pled guilty to crimes they didn't commit. And these are of rapes and murders, the most serious violent crimes possible. So when you think about when the stakes are lower on a misdemeanor crime or a lower level, level felony, it's that much more likely that people are going to plead guilty. The stakes are lower. And we know from DNA-based exonerations that 10% of people are pleading guilty to rape and murder. So it's not just an anomaly. It's actually a trend. It is something that happens. Um, and one of the most important reforms we can put in place in New York State, and there are many, is bringing massive reform to New York's discovery rules. It's an outrage that people accused of crimes considered innocent under the law do not get access to police reports, witness names, witness statements until right before trial begins. We must lead with major reform to New York's discovery rules. Poor discovery affects bail, it affects speedy trials, it leads the innocent to plead guilty, and it leads the innocent to be convicted. Having some of the worst discovery rules in the country, and you've heard a lot about that today, also gets in the way of identifying and correcting police and prosecutors who break the rules. New York has one of the four worst discovery laws in the country. Indeed, many have described the current framework here in New York as trial by ambush since the defense does not receive witness statements and police reports until the eve of trial, making it nearly impossible for the defense to adequately investigate and properly advise or defend their clients. New York falls behind states like New Jersey, just over the river, Texas, North Carolina, Missouri, you've heard them today. So while many in the prosecutorial community in New York have argued that reforming discovery practices will lead to witness tampering or safety issues, prosecutors from those states that have reformed their practices do in fact endorse broader open file discovery and do not claim that they're unable to protect witnesses. It's our hope that this year we will finally bring changes to this truly broken system. While the statutory framework must also be amended to ensure uniform and fair discovery practices in the state, there's no reason why New York City's individual DA offices cannot put in place more pro progressive practices like in Brooklyn. The Innocence Project encourages the committee to ensure robust discovery practices both in the city and also to push the state to take decisive action on this issue this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. In terms of um, I just mentioned Councilmember Eric Ulrich has joined us. He's a member of the committee. Um, in terms of what you see among the five DAs in, in New York and the testimony about what Brooklyn provides, um, is that in the absence of state legislative change, is, is that the standard that you would like to see or are there things that Brooklyn should do differently, particularly from the perspective of um, protecting innocence, um, and then your perspective as a, you know, your background in practice. I mean, I do defer to my defense colleagues since they're the ones actually practicing day to day, but I do know one of the issues, um, you know, and I think that Brooklyn does have uh, very strong discovery practices. I would say that, um, you know, extending that also to homicide cases would be quite helpful. I mean, obviously a lot of our wrongful conviction cases are homicide cases. Um, or combination of rape murder cases. So for that reason, sure, we would like to see that extended as well. But I think, you know, if the other four boroughs were to follow Brooklyn, it would be an incredible, incredible achievement. Have, did something no. you wanted, have, you, have you noticed a difference in the uh, outcomes or the, the prevalence of wrongful convictions among jurisdictions based on their their discovery rules or, or based on the number of wrongful convictions that could be traced back to um, some kind of, uh, but for some version of open discovery? Right, I mean, I think it's a complicated question because so many of our cases involve multiple factors. If you look at a lot of our cases, you'll see there was a false, ident false confession, a misidentification, official misconduct. So it's hard sometimes to tease out you know, what factor was the most prevalent factor in the wrongful conviction. But what I will say, too, is that oftentimes, you know, you will see the revelation of more wrongful convictions in places with more progressive policies. So they shouldn't necessarily be punished for doing the right thing. I mean, I think a lot about Dallas County, which preserved all of its biological evidence and by extension revealed more wrongful convictions than some states have. And that's because they did the right thing. They saved their evidence. Um, and so I think it's, you know, important to think about, um, you know, when we're putting, you know, a more progressive policy in place, and that may indeed re reveal more wrongful convictions, that's, of course, not a reason not to do it. I, I remember my, the prior iteration of my committee, we had a, a hearing on wrong, wrongful conviction. The Innocence Project was there. I, I think Barry Sheck might have mm -hmm. testified. 
and, and he identified, or the project identified, um, a lack of open discovery as one of the significant factors in, in your view um, for the wrongful convictions that your, your organization sees. Absolutely. Um, colleagues, do you have uh, questions? All right. Well, thank you very Anything else? All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate your patience and, and your testimonies. Thank you. Um, so now it's our pleasure to invite up the district attorneys to uh, give testimony. Uh, if, you're, if you're here from the DAs, come on up. So low. I read your testimony. It's very good. I changed it. <laughs> okay, I can officially say good afternoon. I promise I will not have the opportunity to say good evening. Um, <laughs> Would you mind if you raise your right hand so we can swear you in? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Terrific. Um, thank you all very much. I think it would be appropriate, unless you all have worked out some other arrangement, um, for us to first hear from uh, Brooklyn. Since amongst your colleagues, you're probably the least popular fellow in the room today. I'm, I'm well, always can, popular uh, with these colleagues. Uh, can you, can you, can we move that mic over for him? This is fine. Are you comfortable there? Yes. You're good? Okay, great. Good afternoon, Chairman Langman, Landsman, and members of the Committee of, on the Justice System. I am Executive Assistant District Attorney Leroy Fraser, Jr., and I am presenting testimony on behalf of the Office of Kings County District Attorney Eric Gonzalez. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about our discovery practice. The Brooklyn District Attorney is committed to a vision of keeping Brooklyn safe and strengthening community trust in our criminal justice system by ensuring fairness and equal justice for all. Is it because of the video? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. As I was saying, the Brooklyn District Attorney is committed to keeping, to a vision of keeping Brooklyn safe and strengthening community trust in our criminal justice system by ensuring fairness and equal justice for all Without community trust in our system, we are less safe, and indeed, our very democracy is at risk. Procedural justice, or the sense that everyone who comes into contact with our system, whether as a victim, a witness, or someone accused of a crime, is treated fairly by the system, is essential to strengthening community trust. When the community perceives that we, as prosecutors, have a win-at-all-cost mentality and engage in gamesmanship for tactical advantage, it negatively impacts their sense that the system is fair. As prosecutors, our duty to, is to do justice, not just to secure conviction. And DA Gonzalez believes that early discovery in criminal cases is an important part of providing procedural justice. 
Failure to provide the defense of all discoverable material in a timely manner may deprive the defense of the ability to review the material thoroughly, investigate any leads as necessary, and adequately prepare a defense in anticipation of hearings and trial. This inability may, in turn, lead to wrongful conviction, a result that confounds our goal of obtaining justice. Open file discovery aims to curtail such instances by apprising the defense early in the case, not just of the prosecution's evidence of the defendant's guilt, but also of any evidence the defense would consider favorable to the defendant. Accordingly, the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office engages in open file discovery with regard to most matters. However, we recognize that our commitment to procedural fairness and early discovery must be balanced by a concern for the safety of witnesses and the integrity of investigative process. Early discovery may, unfortunately, facilitate a defendant's tampering with evidence or interference with ongoing investigation. Our greatest concern is that early discovery may lead to witness harassment and intimidation and by extension discourage victims and witnesses in a particular case and in general from cooperating with law enforcement. The problem has become especially acute in our age of social media and electronic devices. We must be especially vigilant that the search for justice through the adjudicatory process does not endanger the lives of victims or witnesses or the lives of their families. We take our obligation to protect the safety of, vit of wi victims, witnesses, and their families very seriously. Our office has practiced open file discovery since the mid-1990s. We believe that the practice accelerates the disposition of cases and that worry to return to routine motion practice, the adjudicatory process would slow down considerably. <clears throat> As a general matter, in criminal court where misdemeanors are prosecuted, we provide open file discovery on the first court date after the conversion of the complaint to an information. For felonies, the process begins at the defendant's Sup Supreme Court arraignment on an indictment. Much of the discovery is provided at the arraignment. This allows for defense attorneys to review much of the evidence before their clients must accept or reject a plea offer. This is a meaningful effort to provide not only procedural justice, but allow for quicker resolution of cases. The bulk of the discovery is then provided on the first adjournment following the Supreme Court arraignment. The initial open file discovery packet consists of everything that is then in the people's file except grand jury minutes. Of course, documents are appropriately redacted to withhold witnesses' contact and personal information. Grand jury testimony of any witness whom the people intend to call at trial is turned over after the minutes have been inspected and found sufficient by the court. To the extent that certain items will not be immediately available to the assistant district attorney, Prior to the open file discovery date, such as hospital records, uh, medical records, the result of scientific tests, video, audio recordings, assistant district attorneys are instructed to obtain and provide such items as expeditiously as possible after the initial court date. In the event that people possess a discoverable item, which if disclosed to the defense pursuant to open file discovery timetable, would jeopardize the safety of a victim or witness or endanger the integrity of physical evidence, or adversely affect the legitimate needs of law enforcement, including the protection of confidential informants, assistant district attorneys are trained to provide or to request a protective order. Although we engage in open file discovery with regard to the vast majority of cases, there are a small number of cases where we do not. Generally, we engage in motion practice and not open file discovery in murder cases, gang cases, and special victim <coughs> cases. District Attorney Gonzalez firmly believes that our discovery policy appropriately balances fairness and public safety and advances our overarching goal to keep Brooklyn safe and strengthen the community trust in our criminal justice system <clears throat> by ensuring fairness and equal justice for all. Any preferences? Any takers? Yeah, I'll go next. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Councilman uh, Lanceman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Julian O'Connor. I'm general counsel at the Bronx DA's office. 
I sit on this panel as kind of the uh, unicorn here because uh, my experience is such that I'm not a career prosecutor. I've spent, I started my career as a Bronx defender, uh, the indigent service provider in the Bronx. I spent the vast majority of my career working within the court system um, as a court attorney, seeing the court system through the lens of the judges and on the, I would say, backstage view. And now I have the unique opportunity to serve in the capacity at the DA's office um, in this role. So with that in mind, it, if I don't sound like the prosecutor that you expect, um, that might be a reason for it. Um, so I'd like to start by talking about what DA Clark has done during her transition um, and, and taking the office in a new direction. Uh, the first thing that we know is that she converted the office to, from horizontal uh, to vertical prosecution. And she announced her vision, and that was simply prosecution with integrity. Along with this vital reorganization, there came two pivotal uh, pieces of new units in the office, and that's the Conviction Integrity Unit and the Professional Responsibility Bureau. Um, as we observed in our reinvestigations as part of the Conviction Integrity Unit, we saw ineffective assistance of trial counsel, and we also saw that failure to disclose um, was part of the reasons that the DA had come to her conclusion to vacate and ultimately uh, dismiss uh, three cases in the Bronx. Uh, when we talk about professional responsibility, it's a unit that performed a uh, office-wide evaluation of the best practices and looked into detail with a consultant from outside the office, a longtime practitioner, Chris Hammond, um, to really evaluate our discovery practices. As a result, uh, the Bronx DA office is looking to reshape our substantive practices by expanding what we normally turn over in discovery. So I want to focus my conversation by discussing the practices in the office by considering policy first, um, compliance, uh, witness protection, and then finally resource allocation. Um, so in thinking about policy, what we know is that in, in civil cases, right, you get hit with an avalanche of material to kind of bury the truth. And in criminal cases, um, we don't have the same uh, method of discovery. Um, it's not fair. It doesn't engender trust in the community. And we don't have the goodwill and the confidence of people if we're not fair in this process. Given this reality, there's no opposition to modernizing the existing law to make discovery practices more fair so long as we do not compromise witness safety and the integrity of ongoing investigations. So uh, with that in mind, uh, you know, I think we all know what discovery is. Um, that's the exchange of materials uh, during litigation. For prosecutors, we have an ethical obligation to disclose information. And for the defense bar, it's an opportunity to evaluate the strength of the case and to present an intelligent defense. Fairness requires that trial counsel present reliable information about a case so that a defendant can decide whether or not they're going to plead guilty or go forward. Expanding discovery levels that playing field because it helps defendants begin to investigate with knowledge about the case against them. However, while expanding discovery promotes fairness on one hand, on the other hand, there are increased uh, concerns about witness safety, specifically intimidation and coercion. In addition, we also have to think critically about whether or not there are opportunities for perjury um, if somebody receives information ahead of time and they want to tailor their testimony. Accordingly, increased discovery can promote fairness, but the expectations of the potential benefits are tempered against the potential for that coercion, the perjury, and the exposure that could happen with an ongoing investigation. Now, we're, okay. Go ahead. Um, we're, we're aware that there's uh, significant differences in, let's say, the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. 
right? So we could pronounce policy changes and we could look at the law and people could follow it to the T but not engage in the spirit of what's, what is considered fundamentally fair. So to do this, what we're looking at is truly a cultural change here. So to penetrate this cultural change within the office, what we've done is we have a professional responsibility bureau that includes litigation training, uh, best practices, and an ethics committee. The training piece is the DA investigating in training and educating our assistants, having roundtable discussions before any policy is announced so that we can get the buy-in from our people, we can get people to understand exactly where we're going and why these changes are so important. So that's the piece where the Bronx has, has taken their time to investigate, to learn more, to educate our assistants before pronouncing our policy. Um, the other important piece when we talk about professional responsibility is that there's an ethics committee. So when there's complaints from the community, the defense bar, judges, wherever they come, we investigate those claims, we prepare, prepare findings, and we submit those to the DA herself, and there are recommendations, if necessary and if appropriate, for corrective action. So that's the model that we're considering and the steps that we're taking in the Bronx. Um, when I, I wanted to bring up one more piece because I know that my, my esteemed colleagues are gonna talk in depth about witness safety, um, but I wanna talk about resource allocation. You know, on one hand, we talk about making sure that defense attorneys can effectively represent their clients. So they have to have investigators, they have to have the opportunity to, to put up a meaningful defense. But in the DA's office, we're expanding all of these obligations, right? We know that there is a tidal wave of body-worn camera footage coming with the expansion of uh, body-worn cameras that are going to be available in every precinct. And we're talking about now produce documents early. If possible, turn it all over at arraignments. All of this requires funding. It requires resources. And those resources are at two ends of this. It's NYPD being able to give the DA's office the documents timely, whether we're requesting Gilio, whether we're correct, uh, uh, asking for police reports. And at the same time, it's being able to process all that video, redact, extract, you know, um, collate it, and present it to defense attorneys timely. So that's a resource allocation issue that requires funding. So if, we, if we're going to meet these goals, if we're going to meet these challenges, we have to work that angle as well. And uh, in conclusion, I know I've run out way over, um, I just want to say that if we truly value fairness and integrity, we have to recognize the reality that providing information as early as possible will provide an, a, an effective investigation and informed decisions by defendants. But the DA's office advocates for resources to fund this expansion and promote serious consideration of any policy that also preserves safety and preserves the integrity of ongoing investigations. Thank you. Thank you. So the, 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 the bells are they're not quite a red light, but they are yellow, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, Would you like me to go next? Yes. Good afternoon, Chairman Lantzman and members of the Committee on the Justice System. I am Executive Assistant DA Karen Friedman Agnifilo, and I'm happy to be testifying here on behalf of Cyrus Vance Jr., the Manhattan District Attorney. Uh, sitting here this morning and listening to the testimony by the defense providers was interesting and also uh, gives us an opportunity to explain to the committee there seems to be a difference between perception and reality. And there seems to be testimony about the way things used to be done and the way things at least are moving in a direction to be done, if not already being done. So I'm really happy to be here today to talk about our policies and practices, many of which that have already started, but ones that are also on the way. 
Prosecutors at the Manhattan DA's office have always been committed to complying fully with, if not exceeding, our constitutional, ethical, and statutory obligations with the respect to disclosure of discovery information and documents. In May of 2017, so almost a year ago, we issued a new office-wide disclosure policy that was so important and so basic that our office named it simply, quote, turn it over. Prosecutors must disclose any and all information that is in the file, regardless of the individual prosecutor's assessment of the credibility of the information or its importance to the defense. So if it's in the file, we turn it over. And the suggestion this morning that we only give certain witnesses and not other witnesses is just no longer our policy. Like I said, it's simply called, if it's in the file, turn it over. There are only three exceptions to this rule. Witness safety, unrelated case information that impact privacy, such as photos of a victim's child who might be on her cell phone, or attorney work product. Those are the only exceptions. If it's in our file, we turn it over. Over the past several years, our office has implemented enhanced disclosure practices, offering expedited discovery at the time of Supreme Court arraignment as well. And these are cases primarily where the law enforcement, where law enforcement is primarily the witnesses in the case. And last year, we gave a notification to the defense bar that we would be turning over all of this information at Supreme Court arraignment. It's roughly half our felony cases. It's almost 50 percent. So to suggest that we have open file discovery in only a small number of felonies is simply not true. It's our policy in 50 percent of our cases. It's our practice to do it in far more. In fact, the more serious the case, the bigger the file, the more likely the prosecutor is going to turn over all of that information so that we can have a trial. I'll give you a, a, case, an, a, a case in point of Eitan Pates. That was a trial that occurred with almost 100,000 pieces of discovery information. That was turned over years in advance so that it could be gone through and gone through and made sure that we could all go to trial on time. And those are our most serious cases. However, we take very seriously this idea of compromising the safety and security of a civilian witness. We are currently also expanding this policy on misdemeanor cases that have no witness safety at all. But you should know in our quality of life part, which is where our low-level misdemeanors occur, we've, we've had about 24,000 cases in there so far. That has an open file discovery policy 100%. Every one of those cases, if a defense attorney emails us and asks for it, we'll email the discovery. We're trying to save trees. That's why we're not photocopying them all. What, what's that category of cases that you said? I'm just uh, talking about misdemeanors, misdemeanors in our quality of life part. Only 4% of defense attorneys have asked for the discovery. So it's available. It's just people aren't taking advantage of it. So while the collective impact of Manhattan's practices is to increase fairness in the criminal justice system, a goal that I am happy to hear this committee shares, importantly, we are not doing anything to compromise witness safety. And why do we feel so strongly about this? I'm going to give just one case example. I'm not going to bore you with lots and lots of stories, but there's one recent case that I think it's important to highlight. We had a victim whose name was Scotty Scott. He was a 13-year-old boy who was murdered in Harlem in 2008. A defendant named Daniel Everett, who was a member of a gang called 2MF, fired seven shots in the direction of approximately 50 to 20 rival Lennox Boys members and young bystanders who had gathered to watch a fight. Two bullets pierced Scotty's heart, lungs, liver, and leg, and he died on the scene. Two other victims were seriously wounded but survived. The defendant eventually was convicted and sentenced to 32 years to life in prison in 2012, but only after being recorded on a phone from Rikers Island instructing gang members to intimidate witnesses in the neighborhood and even inside the courtroom. A New York Post columnist wrote at the time, even though the sun had not set and more than two dozen people saw the shooter recklessly whip out a 9 millimeter and aim it at a thick crowd, everyone on the street that day, including two shooting victims who survived, somehow suffered collective amnesia. Nobody wanted to snitch. 
Finally, a full three years after Scotty's murder, a young woman who witnessed the shooting saw Mr. Everett laughing with friends at a basketball game and was upset to see him going on with his life even though she knew he killed Scotty Scott. Even though she was terrified, she came forward to the police. But before being meet, but we had to relocate her from New York for her own safety. The necessity of this measure was apparent during the trial. Upon learning a particular witness's identity, the defendant immediately relayed that information to a fellow gang member on the phone and asked him to press the witness. Not surprisingly, that witness failed to appear in court to testify against them. Although the witness did eventually testify, immediately after his testimony, he came back into the courtroom and begged a 2MF gang member sitting in the back to spare him from retaliation. In a chilling recorded call later that day, the defendant marveled at the effect his intimidation tactics had on the witnesses and commanded his fellow gang members to continue to appear in court, sit in the back of the courtroom, and intimidate witnesses to alter their accounts. As I said, I have other examples. I'm not going to go over them in the interest of time. But I tell this story not to shock or alarm, but to show that witness intimidation is real, and it's a real and present concern. We know from experience that prematurely identifying witnesses not only can result in harassment, intimidation, and violence, this also can prevent people from wanting to come forward and cooperating in the first place and impacts our ability to bring cases and indict cases. I also want to point out and this is something else we're dealing with in the immigrant community. The immigrant community right now is very afraid to come to court because they're worried about ICE and ICE reporting their personal information. And we care very much about protecting our victims and witnesses from such, uh, from such deportation. Our witnesses and victims care just as much to not have their identities and their addresses and their phone numbers and everything else about them handed over to the very individual who just did the thing, the terrible thing, and committed the crime against them. It just seems very, uh, it seems counterintuitive that a young person can be walking down the street, be jumped by a group of kids, a gun could be held to their head, and their items are stolen, they're terrified, and the next thing is we have to now give over their name, their address, their phone number, and all the personal information about that poor individual who was just walking down the street living about their lives. There's great cost to witness uh, relocation. Uh, sorry, in that scenario, you're referring to the, to the victim? Uh, At, to the victim of being jumped and having yes, a gun put to them? correct. That we would now have to turn over the victim's personal identifying information, the name, the address, the phone number, all the ways that you would now find where this individual lives, how to reach them, how to contact them, it just seems counterintuitive that that is what that person who's now, who became a victim of a crime by doing nothing but walking down the street now all of a sudden has to reveal that information. I also want to talk a little bit about witness relocation. That is not the answer. How many people want to be uprooted from their lives and sent to a city where they know no one, away from their families, away from their communities? It's not something people really want to do. We do it. It costs something like $50,000 a year or more to do it. We can do it, but it's not really the thing that everyone wants to do. It does have great cost socially, economically, and personally to the victims. I also I just want to make a comment about protective orders. Uh, protective orders are never a guarantee, and you have to wait until the person is threatened before you can ask for a protective order. So the comment earlier that protective orders are never denied when we ask for them. It's because we don't ask for them when we know legally we can't. We don't ask for them just because. We only go when we meet the legal standard. So we have been examining our own discovery practices for many years. We are in the process of making them more expansive. As I said, we're already in 50 percent of our felony cases giving over discovery at Supreme Court arraignment and in our most more serious cases where there's no witness safety concerns we're doing it as well and we are going to continue to do this uh, and, and be more expansive in this area so long as witness safety is not jeopardized. I want to also talk a little bit about um, 
a concern about a question that, that uh, Your Honor had about um, timing and whether it expedites cases. Uh, I just want to point your attention to the DCJS, the Department of uh, Criminal Justice Services, a statewide agency that keeps statistics. They have a lot of this information. And just for example, if you were to look at uh, the number of cases in New York City, in, New York, in Manhattan, uh, we had 3,858 indictments um, that pled in a particular year, and that took 309 days on average. And in Brooklyn, it was roughly the same. It was 3,581, and that was 315 days. Slightly more, but I would say it's statistically the same. So I don't know that there's any correlation necessarily between um, expedited discovery and, um, and, uh, and case efficiency. I can tell, by the way, you're looking at me that you'd like me to hurry, so I'm going to. Um, it's my move along comportment. I see that. I can see that, and I'm going to move I'm along. I'm going because we want to get to questions. I understand. So let me just see. Let me just make sure there's nothing else. Let me just make sure there's nothing else um, that I want to say other than uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And and we will definitely be talking more with you. No worries. Yes, Chairman, sir. I am uh, Paul Capafari. I'm the Chief Assistant District Attorney on Staten Island. Um, I'm here on behalf of District Attorney McMahon. Uh, we're committed to seeking justice on the behalf of the community and victims of the crime. Every day we work to ensure fairness, efficiency, and transparency within the criminal justice system. We've prepared testimony. I'm just going to do some highlights. We do uh, discovery by stipulation that we copied from Brooklyn on our misdemeanor cases, um, even though we've been in office uh, for two years, it's flown by, we've studied our discovery process, and we're going to go to, we're going to call it early action discovery plan where within 21 days of the arraignment, we'll turn over the police reports, the witness statements, uh, the search warrants, redacted for witness safety. A statement was made. Um, that, sorry, is that in all cases or just misdemeanors? Or That's the felony cases. Oh. So we're going to turn over the felony paperwork within 21 days of arraignment. So That's what we're trying to do. You're breaking news today. Yes. OK, good. Yes, that's our early action discovery. Um, you know, we talked about a, a, a culture change and trying to get people in the office uh, you know, unfortunately, I spent 25 years in the Army, so I like to order people to do things. It doesn't always work. Uh, but we're, we're pushing this through. It is something that we've copied once again from Brooklyn, and that's what we're going to try to do. So we'll, we've always been turning over a voluntary disclosure form, which has the 240 discovery in it. Now we're going to try within 21 days so that at that first adjournment, there's an informed uh, process going back and forth. But it is a cultural change that we're going to try to push through. We talked about uh, resources. Um, I can't emphasize, as was already brought up, the body-worn cameras are a bomb. We have to look at them to make sure of what we're turning over. We intend to turn them over, but we have to catalog them, find them, look at them. That's a resource thing. There was a comment made earlier about alternates to incarceration. Um, I started the mental health court on Staten Island. We've started a veterans court. And I know that uh, Councilwoman Rose, who was in the same building as I am, knows that we want to have a community justice center. Uh, we're hoping for that. Those kind of alternatives, like a community justice center, uh, help you ensure the fairness and the, the disposition of cases, that we can break some of the cycle of recidivism. Uh, we, need a, we need a justice center on Staten Island. Oh, I got a thumbs up and a yes. I got to write that down. <laughs> All right, I got to take that back to the DA. Thank you very much. Do I have a, there we go, thank you. Sir, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Queens.
Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and other members. Uh, Ms. James, uh, I guess I drew the shortest of straws because I think I'm uh, last. Um, oh, you're, like, you're, like, you're like the Mariano Rivera of DAs. Think of it that way. Thank you for that. It's very close. flattering. I'll take it. Um, my name's Bob Masters. I'm an executive assistant district attorney in Queens. Uh, I've been a prosecutor for nearly 28 years. Before that, I spent nine years, like Julian, working in the court system, uh, in both the Supreme Court and criminal court in both Queens and Kings County. Uh, within the office, my duties are varied quite greatly. Uh, but for the last 25 years, I've been trying murder cases as recently as only a few months ago when I worked on the trial of Demetrius Blackwell, the now convicted murderer of the on-duty killing of uh, the posthumously promoted detective Brian Moore. And um, apart from that, I'm Judge Brown's liaison to all law enforcement and governmental agencies. I also supervise all of the training in our office and the appeals efforts to defend all the convictions in the case in the county. Uh, I'm chair of our office's uh, Committee on Professional Standards, which focuses on all of the professional work that's done in any lapses that occur. And uh, the uh, Best Practices Committee that was mentioned, I've been a, a member of that uh, since its inception, and I worked on uh, the working group that developed the protocols for recording interrogations and for identification procedures that were made into law last year and adopted around the state. I've also been on the Mutual Assistance Committee for the District Attorneys Association, and as a result of that, I've worked and helped on a number of complex homicide prosecutions throughout the state. I've been a special assistant in a suburban county, Suffolk. I've also been a special assistant in perhaps one of the most rural counties in the state, Franklin County, and from that perspective, I think I can see a number of things. Um, I'm also the incoming chair of the criminal justice section of uh, the State Bar Association's criminal justice section. I've worked intimately. I've been an officer for the last five years. I've been intimately involved in every single report that's come out of that committee, including the Discovery Task Force report. And in sum, I have to tell you, I've spent a lifetime uh, working exclusively in criminal law. And I think that I've faced all of the public safety issues. And the arc of my career goes back from before the difficulties that cocaine really presented, when cocaine was just the Studio 54 drug, before the crack wars, now all the way through to our opiate crisis. And what I, I'm taken by is that it's always seen as an article of faith that the system is broken. And I think that's uttered by people who unfortunately don't have the historic perspective to realize the time when the system truly was broken. And I say that from the perspective of, in 1992, the first full year of the Brown administration, we endured one murder a day. The last two years for the most ethnically diverse, socioeconomically diverse county of two and a quarter million people, we've been under 50 murders. Uh, uh, a, uh, a year, that's less than one a week. And I think that that shows you that the system was broken then. And hard work has led to safety now being guaranteed to all of our citizens, where I think there was grave doubt in the 80s and 90s about whether or not government worked, about whether or not government could pr provide basic security. I think now that there's been much comfort on behalf of everyone. And in truth, all the diversion programs that have been mentioned by other panelists here, those have all come about through the efforts of the district attorneys. In our office, we have more than 30 of them, and they've all been successful, and they've all led to basically giving an exit ramp for many individuals never to be participants in the criminal justice system again. Now, I think what the advocates are talking about is this trial by ambush phenomenon. And I think that anybody casually looking at the view of this as it's practiced on a daily basis, certainly in my county, is that it's a myth. And the evidence of that is that in 2006, the New York County lawyers conducted a survey on discovery practices around the city. And that report was cited in the NISBA report that's been mentioned. And the results were that little litigation resulted and no impediments to dispositions were occasioned by discovery practices in Queens. And that has been my experience from the years that I've practiced there. And I think you have to look 
at what our discovery laws are and are not. There's a continuum of information that's provided. Article 240, the bulk of it under 240.20, I would say of the entire universe of discoverable material in any case, at least 85% of it is available on demand 30 days after arraignment on an indictment. That is all the scientific reports, crime scene photos. That is all of the scientific information, any surveillance videos, any phone calls. Any, that's the material that a defense attorney needs to know to realize the predicament that his client may be in. Before a suppression hearing, and I would say 90% of cases that are litigated in this city, there is a suppression hearing that's conducted. There's another round of discovery of all of the statements of the witnesses, and it's the detectives who investigated the case. They're the primary witnesses, and all of their materials are turned over. And only a trial, only a trial is the final step in this continuum made possible that civilian witnesses' testimony has to be turned over. And I would say that on the continuum of the universe of everything that's there, it's certainly less than 10% of the discovery that's available in any case. And I will tell you from my experience as a litigator, I myself tried the Zodiac Killer case where that defendant was at liberty for six or seven years. The police developed a room full of discoverable material. I could not turn it over fast enough. I held back a total of about 50 pages of material until two weeks before trial out of concern that one witness asked me to hold it back. I worked on the Wendy's massacre. Every single page of discovery material was turned over months in advance. On the Brian Moore case that I just tried, there were perhaps 8,000 pages of discovery. When we had a sure trial date, about three weeks before we actually saw a jury, Mr. Saunders and I turned over the last 100 pages of discovery material, and within hours, one of the civilian witnesses was reached by an investigator, and I got a harried call from that person, frightened, asking to be relocated, asking do I have to testify. Now, I think we have to look at facts. And John Adams once said that facts are very stubborn things. With regard to this debate about discovery, there are certain facts that are inalienable. New York City has a population approaching 8.6 million people. Last year, there were 290 murders. New York State, population of 19.8 people, 19.8 million people, had a total of 600 homicides, the lowest since 1965 when there were reliable statistics kept. New York State is the fifth safest state in the union, the safest big city. We only have the ninth lowest rate of incarceration in the union. One thing to note, the violent crime index is New York State ranks just in the middle, 26th. So there are reasons for concern. There are reasons that hope for improvement. And what you have to look at is the homicide rates of other cities. Indeed, in Chicago last year, there were 650 homicides for a population of 2.7 million, more than the entire state of New York. In Baltimore, with a population one-fourth of Queens County, they had 343 homicides, seven times more than we did, 18 percent more than New York City with a population 13, 13 times larger. And I think what we've heard here is this very facile argument that has been made that New York's discovery statute is one of the most restrictive in the country, that comparing just one of the 80 articles of New York's criminal procedure law without examining its interaction to the other articles, I think, is intellectually dishonest and I think it's reckless. Because that position assumes that New York City's entire CPL is a prosecution-friendly, regressive statutory scheme. Anything but that is absolutely a complete fiction. Defendants perhaps receive more protections in New York State than any other state in the Union. Constitutionally, Everybody charged with a felony must, it must go through the grand jury. We're almost unique in that. No hearsay is admissible in a grand jury in New York State. That's a unique uh, uh, position. Transactional immunity is available in New York State, another uniqueness. And it must be done within 144 hours after arrest. 
And New York State is one of 17 states, only 17 states, that have automatic judicial review of the procedure of what occurred in the grand jury as to the sufficiency and to make sure that it was appropriate. And our discovery laws are complemented by the notice requirements of CPL 710 1A and 1B. They are unique in the United States. In many states, whether or not a defendant confessed or whether or not he's been identified is subject to ordinary discovery. New York makes those things unique. If we fail to turn those things over within 15 days, we do so under the pain of preclusion. They're out of the case. So that is something that is a defense benefit that is unique anywhere in the United States. And I think what you have to do when looking at what the discovery law is the way it is, is that it was meant to create a balance to the many procedural advantages that are unique to defendants to, in New York. It's to permit law enforcement the opportunity to be thorough, to process, to gather everything that they can, to maintain as much cooperation as they can from all the witnesses. And we've heard now examples of other states that are so wonderful. And by taking one section from their, their statutory scheme and saying that it should be adopted here in New York. Florida is often used as the example. It's promoted as an ideal. But people don't realize that the only grand jury available in Florida is for a capital crime. Hearsay is admissible there. There is use immunity, meaning the target can be automatically called to the grand jury. And apart from that, unless it's a capital trial, a defendant in Florida only gets six jurors and only 10 peremptory challenges unless he's facing life in jail, something that is the minimum requirement of peremptory challenges for anyone charged with a felony in New York State. There, there are actual penalties for the failure of reciprocal discovery, which in New York are completely illusory. So I think comparing our discovery scheme alone without comparing the internet, interconnecting procedural points that are also triggered by it is going to be a distortive process and it creates a funhouse mirror view of what happens on a daily basis. And on a daily basis in Queens County, in our county of two and a quarter million people, which is larger than 13 states, many of whom's procedure people have asked us to compare and use as example. For the past 21 years, I've either been a bureau chief or an executive. And I have to tell you, I get many calls from judges, I get many calls from defense counsel. I've never received a complaint about not having adequate discovery, the hiding of material, about sandbagging. I'll get complaints about us not being ready in time. I'll get complaints about perhaps the attitude of assistance, about sloppy practices. But I have never, ever had a complaint about not having adequate materials to defend a client. The other thing I can tell you is I supervise. I just we want to wrap it up because we, yep. we do want to get to questions. I'm, I'm almost done. In the appellate process, what happens is there may be prosecutorial misconduct claims. They're all related to summation error. With regard to discovery, the only claims have been the loss of materials due to Hurricane Sandy and the erasing of surveillance video. Now, what I'll tell you is this. What has not been focused on at all here has been clearance rates. And that's something that I think everybody has to bear witness to. What a clearance rate is, is what it's the police term. It's solving the crime. It's not a conviction. It's answering who done it. Crimes are solved by the police. It's the gathering of intelligence and information to answer questions to resolve the mystery. Prosecutions are fundamentally different. That's converting that intelligence, that information, into admissible evidence sufficient to satisfy every single element of a crime that's charged. If a mystery is solved, but there's no prosecution, I can't imagine anything worse for society. Because there's no deterrence. There's no preventing the perpetrator from reoffending. There's little impact on our goal of public safety. And New York City enjoys a clearance rate that is the envy of every big city in the United States. Indeed, we're in the position now post 9-11, we've had a social contract with our public. If you see something, say something. It's become a cliche. If any of these changes that are advocated are adopted, it'll be a unilateral renegotiation of that social contract. Those who saw 
and then said, who are brave enough to come in and say, they will soon be revealed and identified of having been the one to have seen and said and told it about the person who's in jail and it'll be known by that person and all of his friends and associates. And I can tell you that that is the reason why we have that clearance rate. That is the reason the conversation you have with a witness to get them to testify, to get them to participate, that I can control the release of that information as long as need be. Without that, and that conversation is replaced by trying to explain the variables of a protective order or the right to redact, I submit to you it's farcical that it would have the same impact. And I ask any parent in this room if they would let their kid testify hearing the, my second speech about the vagaries of a protective order as opposed to the definity of knowing that ultimately there is secrecy attached to their having testified. Now, Karen talked about the change of culture and I have for you a PowerPoint that I'll leave with you that Jim Quinn of our office prepared. I think you've seen it before. Where Breakers it's one? I'm sorry? The Rikers one? No, no, witness okay. intimidation. <laughs> and it is chilling. And I will also show you something <clears throat> that I don't believe has been discussed. The dissenting report from NISBA that was prepared by the only three members on that task force that were prosecutors and all of the attachments they have that reveal the level of witness intimidation. What's that? Yeah, I, well, I got my copy. Mm. Oh. You were... Okay. Good? I'll just say that with conclusion, people come to us to learn how to drive down crime. We have visitors from offices all over the country. I go to Comstat sessions for Queens. They always have visitors at NYPD from other jurisdictions that want to copy and mimic their success. And what we're talking about is borrowing from states where it has not worked in their own jurisdictions. New Jersey was spoken about earlier. I've spoken at length with prosecutors from New Jersey. Their rules are, are, are followed in the breach. Their caseloads swell, nothing happens, and as a result of that, cases die of neglect. That is the type of thing that we're talking about borrowing. Well, thank you, and, and now's the opportunity to, 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 to have questions. Um, I certainly don't mean to pit prosecutorial officers against each other. You are each uh, representing individual, individually elected uh, district attorneys, and you each have your own circumstances and, and, and philosophies. Um, so I'm going to try to have that conversation, and this dialogue, um, without putting anyone on the spot in that way. But. Um, Turning to the, the borough of Brooklyn, I, in your testimony, you, you stated, early discovery may unfortunately facilitate a defendant's tampering with evidence or interference with an ongoing investigation. Our greatest concern is that early discovery may lead to witness harassment and intimidation, and by extension, discourage victims and witnesses in a particular case and in general, from cooperating with law enforcement. The problem has become especially acute in our age of social media and electronic devices. And I think that those concerns represent, if not a, a, a full summation of the concerns that were expressed by the Queens District Attorney's Office, but a, a big chunk of them. And yet, Brooklyn has figured out how to conduct open file discovery. Could you tell us how in Brooklyn, you reconciled these, these very legitimate concerns with, nonetheless, a, a policy of, of open discovery? Well, <clears throat> first of all, you, you have to understand that um, we don't do the open file discovery in homicide cases and mm -hmm. in uh, gang cases and things like that. And this is where uh, we've seen uh, the biggest impact from uh, social media. Uh, we know so let, let me just, sorry, let me just ask you, so let's just understand the exclusion. So it doesn't, you don't apply open file discovery in homicide cases? 
gang, gang cases, cases, any other categories of cases? Some special victims cases and cases where there are prolonged uh, involved investigations. Got it. In those circumstances, there mo there's more of a case by case. What can we turn over consistent with? Well, with homicide cases and gang cases, we adhere to motion practice in accordance with the CPL. Yeah. Okay. And what I was saying was, uh, for example, in one of, I was just talking to an ADA yesterday who was telling me that in a gang case, because we were able to, uh, we turned over DD5s, of which are police reports, in the course, regular course of uh, the CPL. And people can, in one instance, they took a picture of the DD5 with the camera, posted on social media, and resulted in not, uh, witness intimidation and things like that. That's why we don't do it in those cases. Okay. Um, by the way, does, does the office have, is, is the open file discovery reduced to some kind of written policy in your, I don't know, assistance manual or, or something like that? As I said, we've been, the office has been doing it since the 90s, but when DA uh, Gonzalez came in, he has asked uh, one of the councils in our office to, we're in the process now of revamping it and reducing it into a written policy mm -hmm. to make sure that it's uh, applied across the board. He's looking to uh, expand it, move into the area of electronic discovery. Uh, that's one of the things we've been talking about in terms of uh, funding to do that, and we'll be back before you uh, to request funding as part of the budget process for that. And once it is reduced to, to writing, is that something that you can share with us? Because we've requested of all the offices, if they do have a written policy regarding discovery, that they share it with us. We haven't gotten anything, and I would be happy to be corrected from any of you, so I want to ask each of you if you do have a written policy. Once the policy is uh, established and, and uh, put into place, uh, I will, it depends on what, how it's classified as a work product and that sort of thing, but I, I'm sure that we'll be able to All share. Right. Well, at the information. very least, you could let us know that there is a written policy, and then we can have a dialogue about That's whether correct. you can disclose it with us. That's fine. And, and Staten Island, have, have, has this, this, this new breaking news it policy? <laughs> we can get it for you. Bronx, um, if I understood your testimony correctly, it sounds like the office is seriously looking at, at formalizing some kind of open discovery process. Is that, uh, a, is that a fair characterization, or you want to put that in your own words? Uh, I think what's fair is that we have a, a working draft of policy considerations for misdemeanors that um, is pretty expansive and would look to include open file discovery. Um, in our felony practice, uh, we're looking to provide discovery earlier. Um, however, we're in a uh, kind of beta test mode right now. We started uh, what's called an SEI part um, just this uh, Monday in the Bronx. And part of the process that we're engaging in is, is doing something novel, which is pre-indictment discovery um, on those cases. And what we're looking to turn over in those cases within two weeks uh, is uh, what would normally be considered just the police paperwork that we have available. Um, after that two week period, then uh, it, please note that this is in exchange for defense counsel waiving either 3030 or 18080. We do not have the process like in Queens where um, their defense bar routinely waives in order to receive uh, an offer on the case. Um, so, you know, this is a big culture change in the Bronx where, uh, you know, we're trying to engender trust on both sides. And so supplying some of that uh, police paperwork early and providing an offer early, we're going to see if that results in um, you know, faster dispositions or an improved process. But I think through going through this beta test, it will inform what our discovery practices can be in the felony realm, whether they be sooner, and um, what documents will be included. Right. And have, have in terms of your internal process, is there a, a date by which you're going to assess how this, this pilot, for want of a better term, is, has so the, the court system it itself, uh, the defense bar, the court system, and the DA's office, we're engaged in this part, and we've 
put a tentative 60-day beta test on it uh, to see how it's working so we can kind of determine after that 60-day period if we see some results. But within uh, the DA's office itself, uh, we haven't set a strict timeline for when we're gonna pronounce policy. We're gonna take our time and really uh, penetrate the culture of the office, educate our assistants, and make sure that we come up with something that works best for us. Because uh, as you can see, there's a range um, of practices within New York City when it comes to uh, discovery. All right, <clears throat> but it's fair to say that the office is looking to expand um, its disclosure, its voluntary disclosure obligations. Absolutely. And where that will take you still remains to be determined. Correct. Okay. Um, so, Manhattan, I just want to understand, we haven't gotten any written policies from you, but we have what has been shared with us by others, which seems to be, or might be, your office's policy. So, so have you reduced your discovery policies to some kind of memorandum or 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 or, um, or, or written policy that that we can see? So we have been uh, like others, like like um, the Bronx. We have been testing different types of discovery uh, to evaluate it as well. And there was a, there was a. Um, Excuse me. I'm listening. Okay. There, there was a, um, a pilot project that we did in Manhattan where we took two equal Supreme Court parts, same trial bureau in our office, so there should be no, the management was the same. And we did this thing where we said we are going to do open file discovery in the category of cases. Uh, if the defense attorney will give us a date certain for trial. And most defense, about half defense attorneys opted out. They didn't want to do that. They don't want a date certain for trial. And I say this because there's, there's sort of a, a, a false narrative that's being perpetuated that somehow delay is the prosecutor's friend. But I will tell you, we want cases to go quickly. We want cases to go as quickly as possible. And I will get to your answer in a minute, but, but I have to give a little history here. We want cases to go quickly because memories fade, evidence gets lost, witnesses' interest in participating fades, witnesses can be scared to testify, police officers can retire. Cases don't get better with time. So for us, the sooner a case goes, the better. And the sooner we can get justice, the better. So we want them to go quickly. So we have said to the defense bar, both in that pilot project as well as more recently, which is related to this that you just handed me, more recently we sent a letter to every defense provider that, that practices in Manhattan and said, if you want an expedited trial schedule, 30 days from Supreme Court arraignment or 30 days prior to when you want the trial, we will give you all your discovery if you'll give us, tell us the name of the defendant, the case, and we'll put it on an expedited trial schedule. We have yet to get a single request. So there, there's just this kind of myth out there that somehow we want delays and we're, we're tactically not turning things over. That, despite the fact that we're not seeing uh, we're not seeing cases going faster. We're not seeing requests for this, for expedited discovery. We still think it's important, like my colleagues, to improve discovery practice and make the, the system more efficient and more fair. So what we've done is we've carved out certain categories of cases where we are going to do this routinely. And what you handed me is a copy of the memos of a certain category of cases where it's the policy. Now that does not mean that we don't do it in other types of cases. It's just those other types of cases are more on a case-by-case -case basis. The more, the more serious the case, the more you're going to turn over because you want the case to go. You know that if you have voluminous discovery, it's going to delay things and you don't want that to happen. So there are certain types of cases though. Sexual assault cases is, a, is an area where we don't have a policy of open file discovery or turn it over. Gang cases, we are not doing that at this point. Homicide cases, we're not doing it. 
domestic violence cases. There's certain categories of cases that we have not put in this memo because we'd rather make a case-by-case -case assessment. But the memo from, I believe this is from May of uh, 2017. 2015. I'm sorry, 2015. <clears throat> no, you handed me two memos. You handed me one called expedited discovery. There's no date on it. That's not dated. It's not okay. dated. I believe. Was that the one from May 2017 yes. you referenced before? That's what I was okay. about to uh, uh, And then there's an indicate. That's from May of 2017. That's a categorical type of case where there's a just, policy just, of turn it over. Just give me one, one second. I need to get yelled at a little bit. Go ahead. So there's a so there's so there's one memo from May of 2017 that puts together the policy for a certain category. Again, this this is 50 percent of our felony indictments. This is a huge number of cases where we say just open file at Supreme Court arraignment. All the other cases, the other 50 percent, are ones that fall into the category like my colleague Mr. Frazier, who used to work at the Manhattan DA's office and now is at Brooklyn. Uh, he, uh, those are the types of cases that we also hold back and don't do it, and we're not putting in this policy because we make case-by-case -case assessments. The second document you handed me is dated January 2015, and this is this applies to all cases in the whole office. This is this is what's known as if it's in the file, turn it over, and this just means we don't want prosecutors making their own assessments of what they think is relevant in the case, what might be relevant to the defense. Let the defense attorneys make that that um, that determination. Thank you. So the example that was given earlier about how you're only going to be giving over Rosario from witnesses that are testifying, but maybe there are other civilians who were eyewitnesses but aren't testifying, that we wouldn't turn that over. That is technically what the law says we can do. And that is the way many prosecutors, and I'm sure including in my office, used to practice years and years and years ago. DA Vance changed all of that, and so that's why in 2015, this went out. It says, if it's in the file, turn it over, period, end of story. You don't make any determination of whether it's material, about whether it's relevant. There's just three exceptions. And again, witness safety, personal privacy, and work product. But, the, but otherwise, it, it, goes, uh, it gets turned over to the defense. So the way we practice today is very different than what I heard this morning. What do you what do you think accounts for the defense bar having a very, very different perspective on the way discovery works in the Manhattan DA's office than what you understand it to be? I mean, as as you said, what you heard this morning is very different from what you understand your practices to be. I think it's a combination of things. I think first of all, there's a long history of us practicing a certain way. And so, um, and we're not perfect, and culture change is not easy. It's something that takes time. So I'm sure there are some people in my office, we, we do a lot of cases. We're, we, don't, we no longer do 100,000 cases a year. We probably, we're down to about, um, about 60,000 60, cases a year. Um, but we have a lot of cases and about 500 lawyers. So I'm sure there are still some people who uh, don't follow the rules perfectly, and that's a management issue. So we and we try to address it. And any defense pers uh, any defense attorney who wants to bring that, this to my attention should, you know, like my colleague here from Queens, I haven't gotten these complaints, but certainly I'm sure we're not perfect. So if we aren't doing it, I'd like to know about it. It's also relatively new. It's from May of 2015, and I think that perhaps. People who are testifying here aren't aware of what's happening, what's happening in um, in the courtrooms. I think the final reason, and I can't, you'd have to ask them ex why there's that disconnect. But I think the final reason is because at the end of the day, what they really want is this 10% of information that um, my colleague from Queens was talking about. They really. 
we're really only f arguing over 10% of information because 90% of everything else is given over in most cases. It's really just that information about the witnesses and where they live and who they are and how they can now go and do their research. There's so much available about people on the internet, right? You can think about the amount of things you can find on social media and in everywhere else that you can sort of I learn. Understand. And that's what they want. And so that's why there is, is this kind of um, feeling and this kind of sense because what they really want is the thing that we're struggling with whether or not to give over right. in order to protect witnesses. Uh, and then I want to have, give my colleagues the opportunity to ask questions. Um, but that, that 10 or 15 percent, whatever the right number is, and I don't know if that includes 10 or 15 percent of what you're required to give over or the 10 and 15 percent of, of the whole body of open file discovery that you'd have, you would give over, you, documents and information you'd give over if it was truly open file meaning the, the, the kinds of reports that was referred to before that you may never, under the discovery law, be required to turn over. But whatever it is, you know, when you testified before about, I think it was the person who had a gun put to their head and had their phone stolen or had something stolen, and I asked you, are you talking about the, 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 the victim? Like, and, and Mr. Master, when you talked about um, the person whose information was turned over to witness and then they were contacted by an investigator. Isn't there an inherent unfairness for the defendant who has got to um, defend against losing his liberty to not know who the witnesses are, not know who the victim is in a timely manner so that they can do their own investigation and, and be able to to prepare their their defense, the the you know the bar association report that you served on, it it's what I quoted from in my opening. You were you were in the in the, in the dissent. Yeah, I was going to say, have you read the dissent? I I I did. It, I heard your voice throughout it. I I did. Um, that would be most of the witnesses that ever come in to walk through the door would agree with the dissent. Yeah. No, I I'm sure that they would. They're not coming from the perspective most witnesses, and and I was, I guess, sort of a witness in one minor insignificant case. Like, like they're not charged with the obligation of doing justice. They're, they have their perspective, and they want to get their result based on what they they know happened. Are, aren't you are you concerned about just the un, the unfairness of? Of, of a defendant not having access to that information in a timely manner so they can defend themselves? I'm very conscious that the defendant, and I think it is sacred, is entitled to the right to confront people who say he did things. That right should attach in a courtroom. It shouldn't attach in a poor victim's living room. It shouldn't attach at his place of work. It shouldn't attach when he's unsuspecting. It should, a person who's already endured a crime, who's already been victimized, shouldn't be frightened on top of it. And I can tell you in the last case that I tried that I had to negotiate with a witness who had evidence that was devastating to Mr. Blackwell's commission of the crime and evidence that was more subtle that undermined his psychiatric defense that he was offering. The morning he was to testify, he bailed out on me. I had to negotiate with him that he would only testify to the subtle information, not the devastating information. That way he could go back to his community and not be bothered by others for being a snitch. That's the culture we live in today. That's a reality. That's a reality. One thing I'd just like to, about in Queens, just I didn't make it clear earlier. We have 60,000 arrests a year. Of those, 70% are misdemeanors, 30% are felonies. Ultimately, 77% of the felony arrests are reduced to misdemeanors. All of those misdemeanor cases, we have voluntary early disclosure of all discoverable information. We do it by email. We offer it and assistants send it to the defense counsel by email automatically. And for all of those cases, and it's probably 90% of those arrests that occur in our county, the only defense attorneys we don't send it to are the ones who don't want it digitally, and they have to wait to get paper copies, and that's, that's the culture that we have within criminal court. 
Among cases that remain felonies, between 45 and 50 percent are resolved by superior court information without going to the grand jury. That's the plea policy that Ms. Luongo was talking about and that she took fault with. Discovery, there's almost no formal calendar calls. Everything is done in a conference room setting. And the defense attorney gets to meet as many times as they want with either a bureau chief or a deputy to discuss the strengths and weaknesses of the case. And what we've found as an unintended consequence of that since we put that policy in place in 1996 is that we have had virtually no claims of wrongful conviction since that date. Because in the conference room setting, when plea bargains are being offered, the evidence is being discussed, if I know when I did it, I would ask, is there something wrong with the offer? And the defense attorney would say, no, it's generous. It's just that my guy didn't do it. I'd say, your guy didn't do it? What do you got? Let's talk about it. And together, we would go out and get the employment records, the surveillance video, check for hospital records, check for school records, all the things necessary. And in real time, within 90 days after the arrest, that was where the defendant was cleared. And that's the best way of stopping a wrongful conviction without a wrongful indictment. Okay, thank you. Um, Madam Public Advocate, do you have a question? <laughs> so, okay, so I, there's just so much to unpack here. Um, is there a uh, in conviction integrity unity in each of the boroughs? Can we start with Staten Island? So it's about resources for Staten Island. I know we have one in Brooklyn. Bronx? Yes. yes. Manhattan? Yes. Queens? Queens? We don't because, frankly, we have currently three, three claims of wrongful conviction pending at all. And that is one from the 1960s and two from the 1980s. All the cases predate the Brown administration. And frankly, because of the, f the, the tiny number, the district attorney is able to assign an executive and a staff to work on each individual case. And we don't need to dedicate an entire unit to it. And uh, again, do each of the boroughs support or oppose the legislation pending in Albany, Staten Island? Yes. Can you use the, um, the mic? There's one next to you. Is it fair to say that three, there are three protections from what I gather from the testimony? Witness intimidation, uh, work product, and three just um, superfluous information such as pictures of, as was mentioned by Manhattan, the f children, et cetera, et cetera. With the protection of witnesses, yes. we can handle discovery, yes. So um, with some changes, you would support legislation pending in Albany? Yes. Brooklyn? Yes, we, we still have them under review, but generally speaking, uh, as stated by my colleague, we're concerned about the witness intimidation. Uh, and some of the bills, uh, I'm not sure when you said the, the legislation, yeah. the, the governor's bill or, or senator or the Let's look assembly. at the governor's bill. Okay, but with the governor's bill, generally uh, we uh, support it. There are some concerns that we have. One of the things that I will say, since you're talking about legislation, yeah. is we've been for some time talking about witness intimidation. And right now, the way the bills, uh, the law is set up now, mm -hmm. it's almost worth it to intimidate a witness because there's no mandatory consecutive uh, 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 penalty. So if, in fact, I'm going to attempt to intimidate someone and then I'm not going to be penalized even further, even if I'm convicted, not by mandatory, that's something that we've always asked for, and I think that would uh, go a long way toward helping with the witness intimidation issue. I see. So there needs to be a corollary a piece of legislation to increase penalties for witness intimidation. Yes. Bronx? Um, the, the Bronx DA office recognizes that there definitely needs to be some modernization of our laws. Mm -hmm. um, but we do bear in mind that witness safety, um, privacy interests, sure. um, protecting ongoing investigations are crucial to maintaining the safety in our community. So to sum up, you're basically reviewing the legislation. You don't have a position. Is that fair to say? Our view of the legislation is that if those concerns are memorialized within their proposals, we would be in favor of it. Thank you. Manhattan? Manhattan's uh, position is very similar to my colleagues in uh, Brooklyn and in the Bronx, that with some changes that uh, protect witness safety uh, and enhance penalties, we also view this as an opportunity to modernize our state discovery system and we would be able to support, would, would actually advocate for it uh, with those protections in place. Thank you. 
And um, I'm also the District Attorneys Association representative that goes to Albany. Um, there are separate bills that are out there. There's yeah. the governor's proposal. There's an assembly proposal. Yes. The Senate Democrats have talked about coming up with a proposal. I've yet to see text, but I think that it may well mirror what is the assembly proposal. I can say that the governor's proposal, although very well intended, is gravely flawed in that it accelerates certain things that are impossible for any prosecutor's office to keep up with, selecting of experts within 15 days after arraignments, having search warrants turned over and confidential informant information and cooperation agreements within 15 days. It's incredibly impractical that we would ever be able to have cooperators and confidential informants if we had to reveal information 15 days after uh, uh, indictment. And it's also likely unconstitutional. It builds in a uh, right of appeal, but with only one appellate division judge. By definition, there can be no appeal. So it's fair to say that panel. Queens opposes the governor's uh, We bill. do. And the, the assembly uh, provisions, I think, provide very little protection at all to any witnesses. So we would oppose it on that ground. And lastly, um, as was mentioned by the chair, uh, how do the boroughs feel, or each of the, I'm sorry, each of the respective district attorneys um, feel with respect to empirical analysis of um, our system to determine whether or not there's any abuses. Would you agree to some sort of independent empirical analysis, either by the council or some outside entity, to determine whether or not there have been any abuses with respect to our discovery system? Let's start again with Staten Island. <laughs> <laughs> Queens, would you, would you support an analysis? Well, from having appeared in front of the Justice Task Force for the better part of 18 months, that resulted in basically the same product as the state bar, which was uh, one group in the majority, another group very fervently in the minority. I don't know that you're going to wind up with anything else other than the same results we have continually. What I will tell you from going around the state and the difficulty of trying to find a one-size-fits-all proposal is that a set of laws that are going to apply to a major metropolitan area here, as well as to a suburban area, as well as to a rural area, is almost impossible. Mm. And many of these laws have in it the fixed trial date, which in New York City is the 12th of never. That is the date that well, is the well, fixed trial date. Well, as opposed to the rural, rural counties upstate. They do have fixed trial dates no, I, no, there, I and that's why it works for them. No, I understand. It. What about an empirical analysis of just the five boroughs? What about that? I, I don't think it's going to reveal anything else other than what we already know. Okay. And I, I don't know how you would empirically do the measurements, because I, th I think that all of these things, I think anybody who is any corporation that would be looked at to try and uh, apply business models would find out that there are so many differences just based within the boroughs in socioeconomic status. Basically, the ethnicity of each borough would have impacts, the type of crime that impacts each co uh, county. Thank you. Manhattan? Uh, we would happily participate in any analysis that anyone would want to do, as we always do, but we too participated in Judge Lippman's Justice Task Force. It was an 18-month review. It had defense attorneys, prosecutors, advocates, was really comprehensive and they did a, an extensive study and I think that uh, if there was anything left to do that wasn't already done of course we'd be uh, always happy to participate. Thank you. Um, we formally take no position as to any long-term regression analysis that would involve the five boroughs um, looking at data and the reason I say I take no position because I think a better use of our resources would be to fund the actions that we want to occur. Rather than putting that money in a think tank and an organization to come in and evaluate, we should put money in NYPD, in the prosecutor's office, so that we can actually act. If you give us the overwhelming resources to have paralegals, uh, ready and available. If NYPD has a robust law department where they can go through our claims and turn over Giglio on a regular basis to us timely, I think that's where we will see action as opposed to evaluation. Thank you. I would just say that I know that uh, DA Gonzalez is uh, open to examining and analyzing uh, data and the issues within the criminal justice system. That's to what you're describing, I would have to have a conversation with them on that, but uh, I tend to say that uh, 
we are open to examining and we, because the goal is to improve and enhance not only the criminal justice system but the uh, trust uh, uh, that, that we want the people of Brooklyn to have within the system. Thank you. And I too have not spoken to the DA uh, about this, but I, I would go with the resources to give us the resources and then see what we do with them. So uh, the Bronx and Staten Island had shown me the money. Um, Brooklyn and <laughs> Manhattan were open to it. And Queens, basically, it's not broken, so don't fix it. Is that fair to say? That's basically the results of my daily practice, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rose. Thank you. Hi, Paul. Um, you know, Staten Island had had um, some of the most restrictive open discovery um, laws. And I'm really excited to hear that, you know, you've adopted an early action discovery plan. So I, I just want to be really clear about what this plan um, actually is going to do. And so um, in your proposal, um, in fact, there was one that you released last week. Um, there was a written stipulation order that only um, was only covered under CPL 240.20 um, uh, materials. And um, did that include the Rosario material that comes under CPL 24044 and 24045? No, what we intend to is continue with our voluntary disclosure form that we give over at arraignment and then much as Brooklyn does without the grand jury minutes, turn over the rest of the discovery within the 21 days. Uh, we haven't implemented it yet. We're going to try to implement it now. It's a, it's a matter of collecting up the information and then protecting the witnesses and the victims and then turning it over. We've been doing the discovery by stipulation in the misdemeanor cases for a number of years now. Um, and These are felony cases, and we're going to make the same exceptions that Brooklyn makes for special victims' cases, murders, and gang cases. And um, does your proposed order um, permit the prosecutor to redact the information without obtaining a protective order from the court first? We intend to hand over the information redacted, and if we have to, we'll seek a protective order. And so... Um, Will you revise this proposal to remove the expansive power to redact? Being that there is protections already in place for witnesses? Well, the protections are that we're not going to give away their name or their phone number or their address. And I think it was for the reasons that Mr. Uh, uh, that, uh, Mr. Masters uh, pointed out. They but, can, the, the defendant can confront them in court, but this way the defendant also gets the information of, you know, who are your witnesses? Well, it's an eyewitness, it's somebody you heard from somebody else, whatever the police report says. But doesn't the existing law already protect, you know, um, uh, protect the witnesses? By well, the, you know, the, the, by the, the uh, law uh, by being prohibit. able to um, issue protective orders, the law might protect them by saying people can't intimidate them. But our experience is people are immediately uh, contacted. It's on social media. Uh, people take pictures. We've seen uh, grand jury minutes posted on bulletin boards. How many protective? Uh, how many motions for protective orders? Um, were brought by uh, your office in 2017. Wow, I don't know. I don't know. Is that something you could get for me? I, I could probably ask the DAs, yes. Okay. And so um, cameras and their recordings are uh, critical evidence to support or contradict testimony in the trials. Um, you stated in your statement um, that without the resources to um, sort of process these um, body cameras um, and the information and the evidence that you will not participate or that it makes your participation in your own early action discovery plan um, impossible? 
Well, we're certainly not going to turn over any body-worn cameras that we haven't looked at. So no, I'm, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying you are saying that um, without the resources, that basically the plan you proposed here today will, is impossible to expedite, is impossible to execute. It's impossible to promise to turn over all the body-worn cameras until we've identified them, gotten them, and watched them. That's not what you said in your statement. Your statement said, these resources are needed even without the demands of earlier discovery deadlines, but with early action discovery or any new discovery law passed by the state, these resources are absolutely critical. Without them, early discovery will, quite frankly, be impossible. I, I see it as impossible to turn over body-worn cameras to the defense within 21 days without additional resources, yeah. Um, and, and, your, um, and in terms of uh, redaction, um, you said, I must emphasize that the right to redaction is essential to the fair administration of justice, and we cannot and will not proceed with our open files without it. So what you presented to us today is conditional. We're going to redact the identity of the witnesses, yes. And, is, and that's all that's going to be redacted? We're going to redact anything that identifies the witness. We're trying to protect the witness. So the fact that there's going to be redaction, you're only going to redact that which protects the witness. Yes. You're not going to redact other information that might be presented. I, I, I don't know what you're asking me. Okay. All right. I'm not the lawyer here, uh, so I might not be as clear or um, I, what I am trying to do, though, is to be transparent. And I don't want this plan presented as if it's going to be open and a complete open file. It, we're, we're not calling it open and, and file. When, when it is not. And I'm, I'm trying to ascertain exactly what this, your plan, being that. Richmond County has been the most restrictive so far. I want to know what your plan is actually going to do and, you know, what restrictions are still going to be in place. How, how is what you're going to do different from what we commonly refer to as open file discovery? I think that's the question. We're going to redact the name and address and identity of the witness in the police report. And we're other, not gonna, we're not other gonna, than that, it's going to be we're not going to redact the body of the police report, but if the police report says, I live on the third floor in apartment so F, other, other than, right, I get and it. I other, looked out the window and saw Other the than the redaction of the witness information, no, we're not gonna, what you're producing is, is synonymous with what we know as open file discovery. And it's the information that gives the defense a chance to see what the case is against them. Okay. Okay, th and that's what I, I wanted to know. Uh, just how much was going to be redacted um, in your new plan? And witness so, identity. It's only witness identity. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Ulrich. Thank you. I, I will be brief, Chair, and I want to thank you. I know we have other hearings, and uh, I'm sure you have other business to attend to today, but I want to thank you all for your testimony. Um, I want to ask a question that, that came up actually when I chaired the Veterans Committee and we talked about the, veteran, the establishment of the Veterans Treatment Court around the five boroughs and we discovered that at the time, uh, thankfully it's no longer the case, but the, the uh, VTC did not exist in each county because it, it required the consent of the prosecutor and the, uh, I think the chief judge in each, uh, in each court, if that's correct. I think that mirrors in a lot of ways the um, some of the questions that are coming up today about the open file discovery and the disparities that exist between each counties, it, it, it almost seems illogical to me why the state 
or the, uh, the chief judge wouldn't come up with a uniform standard, you know, that, that, that is applied in all the counties and all the courts and that has to be followed by all the district attorneys. Why don't we just have one set of rules with respect to the discovery practices that applies evenly across the state? Or more locally in the criminal court system in New York City, which is a, you know, one criminal, New York City criminal court, but we've got five DAs and five different uh, discovery practices. Why, well, you know, why? <laughs> Sir, with all due respect, we have one standard. It's in the criminal procedure law. That, that state standard is in the state criminal procedure law. But, it, but in practice, it's not the case because the, yeah. the issue is, if I may, Please. there is widespread but not universal recognition that the current discovery statute is inadequate. And in some district attorney's offices, well, actually all district attorney's offices, have to some degree or another supplemented what is the underlying minimum requirements. And we're here talking about what each office has done and uh, the belief of, of, of most of the people who've asked questions, most of the council members um, and most of the bar is that uh, more should be done. Mr. Chairman, I think if yes. you went around the state, you'd find out that the 62 chefs that are the district attorneys all season to taste. They take the basic recipe of the Article 240 of 710 and they add to it. And that's generally what we find is what will satisfy basically local practice and makes for the fairest system in each county. Has, has Mr. Masters, has the Bar uh, Association uh, provided any recommendation for reforming this? Is that? They did. Uh, in 2015, there was a long task force report that basically amounted to a food fight where the defense had a very, very uh, extensive recommendation for change and the prosecution had, I think, a very uh, heartfelt and reasoned uh, approach for leaving things as they were. And I think these two universes collide on a daily basis about the need for reform uh, for prosecutors, I think, and for the police. Changing discovery is existential. It will change the way we do business. We do believe the domino effect will be that a case that we could bring today, we won't be able to bring tomorrow, that someone will be at liberty that might not be at liberty otherwise, and that ultimately someone will be wounded or killed that wouldn't have been wounded or killed if we didn't make these changes. I would just say the case for change, I think, is a little broader than that and the Bar Association task force that is being referred to uh, came out with a majority recommendation for a broad series of, of changes, and there were those who had a different view, and they produced a minority report. And, and, I just say it, it's a little more. And next year when I'm chair, I could rig a committee that would come out with an opposite result. Yeah. That's, I, the, that's the truth, Mr. Lansman. I think that the debate is, is more than prosecutors and defense being at loggerheads or having different points of view. But here's the report. I will, a little, I will, a little uh, light reading for the ride home. Light reading. I will uh, just close, Mr. Chair, by uh, saying that, you know, the system is not perfect, but I, I want to thank you for the great work that you do, each of your offices in keeping the people of this city safe, working with our law enforcement agencies, and really giving our neighborhoods back to the people of the city uh, so they can live in a safe city and work in a safe city and raise their families in a safe city and the system is not perfect. There are reforms that are, I'm sure are worthy of consideration, but I think you're all doing a hell of a job and I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You very much. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I, I just want to thank um, the council staff, council of the committee, Brian Crow, the policy analyst for the committee, um, Casey Addison, my staff, um, Rachel Kagan, uh, Josh Levitt, and Jordan Bieberman for helping um, put this hearing together. And I thank you for all of your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.